This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. Ulysses by James Joyce. Section 16, Part 3. This morning, Heinz put it in, of course, the remains of the late Mr. Patrick Dignam were removed from his residence, number 9 Newbridge Avenue, Sandy Mount, for interment in Glasnevin. The deceased gentleman was a most popular and genial personality in city life, and his demise after a brief illness came as a great shock to citizens of all classes, by whom he is deeply regretted. The obsequies at which many friends of the deceased were present, were carried out, certainly Hines wrote it with a nudge from Corney, by Mrs. H. J. O'Neill and Son, 164 North Strand Road. The mourners included Patrick Dignam, son, Bernard Corridan, brother-in-law, Juno Henry Menton, solicitor, Martin Cunningham, John Power, Eaton one-eighth Ador Dorado Duradora must be where he calls monks the day father about Keyes's ad. Thomas Cannon, Simon Dedalus, Stephen Dedalus, B. A. Edward J. Lambert, Cornelius T. Kelleher, Joseph McKines, L. Boom, C. P. McCoy, McIntosh, and several others. Nettled not a little by L. Boom, as incorrectly stated, and the line of bitched type, but tickled to death simultaneously over C. P. McCoy and Stephen Dedalus B. A., who were conspicuous, needless to say, by their total absence, to say nothing of Mackintosh. L. Boom pointed it out to his companion B. A., engaged in stifling another yawn, half nervousness, not forgetting the usual crop of nonsensical howlers of misprints. Is that first epistle to the Hebrews, he asked as soon as his bottom jaw would let him, in? Text, open thy mouth and put thy foot in it. It is, really, Mr. Bloom said, though first he fancied he alluded to the archbishop, till he added about foot and mouth, with which there could be no possible connection. Overjoyed to set his mind at rest, and a bit flabbergasted at Miles Crawford's after all managing to. There. While the other was reading it on page two, Boom, to give him for the nonce his new mi misnomer, whiled away a few odd leisure moments, in fits and starts, with the account of the third event at Ascot on page three, his side. Value one thousand sovs, with three thousand sovs in specie added, for entire colts and fillies. Mr. F. Alexander's throwaway, B.H. by right away, five years, nine stone, fourteen pounds, W. Lane, one Lord Howard de Walden's Zinfandel, M. Cannon, Z. Mr. Z. Mr. W. Bass's Sceptre, three. Betting five to four on Zinfandel, twenty to one throwaway, off. Sceptre a shade heavier, five to four on Zinfandel, twenty to one, throw away, off. Throw away and Zinfandel stood close order. It was anybody's race, then the rank outsider drew to the fore, got long lead, beating Lord Howard de Walden's chestnut colt and Mr. W. Bass's Bay Philly Sceptre on a two and a half mile course. Winner trained by Brame, so that Lenehan's version of the business was all pure buncombe. Secured the verdict cleverly by a length. One thousand sovs with three thousand in specie. Also ran J. de Bremond's French horse Bantam Lyons was anxiously inquiring after, not in yet, but expected any minute. Maximum two. Different ways of bringing up a coup. Love-making damages. Though that half-baked Lyons ran off at a tangent in his impetuosity to get left. Of course gambling eminently lent itself to that sort of thing, though as the event turned out, 
The poor fool hadn't much reason to congratulate himself on his pick, the forlorn hope. Guesswork had reduced itself to, eventually. There was every indication they would arrive at that, he, Bloom, said. Who? The other, whose hand, by the way, was heard, said. One morning you would open the paper, the cabman affirmed, and read, Return of Parnell. He bet them what they liked. A Dublin fusilier was in that shelter one night and said he saw him in South Africa. Pride it was killed him. He ought to have done away with himself or lain low for a while. After committee room no fifteen until he was his old self again, with no one to point a finger at him. Then they would all to a man have gone down on their marrow bones, to him to come back, when he had recovered his senses. Dead he wasn't. Simply absconded somewhere. The coffin they brought over was full of stones. He changed his name to De Wet, the Boer general. He made a mistake to fight the priests, and so forth and so on. All the same Bloom, properly so dubbed, was rather surprised at their memories, for in nine cases out of ten it was a case of tar-barrels, and not singly, but in their thousands, and then complete oblivion, because it was twenty-odd years. Highly unlikely, of course, there was even a shadow of truth in the stones, and even supposing, he thought, a return highly inadvisable, all things considered. Something evidently riled them in his death. Either he petered out too tamely of acute pneumonia, just when his various different political arrangements were nearing completion, or whether it transpired he owed his death to his having neglected to change his boots and clothes after a wetting, when a cold resulted in failing to consult a specialist, he being confined to his room till he eventually died of it amid widespread regret, before a fortnight was at an end, or quite possibly they were distressed to find the job was taken out of their hands. Of course, nobody being acquainted with his movements, even before there was absolutely no clue as to his whereabouts, which were decidedly of the Alice, where art thou, order, even prior to his starting to go under several aliases such as Fox and Stewart, so the remark which emanated from friend Cabby might be within the bounds of possibility. Naturally, then, it would prey on his mind as a born leader of men, which undoubtedly he was, and a commanding figure, a six-footer or at any rate five feet ten or eleven in his stockinged feet. Whereas Mrs. So-and-so, who, though they weren't even a patch for the former man, ruled the roost after their redeeming features were very few and far between. It certainly pointed a moral, the idol with feet of clay, and then seventy-two of his trusty henchmen rounding on him with mutual mudslinging. And the identical same with murderers, you had to come back. That haunting sense kind of drew you, to show the understudy in the, in the title role how to. He saw him once on the auspicious occasion, when they broke up the type in the insuppressible, or was it United Ireland? A privilege he keenly appreciated, and, in point of fact, handed him his silk hat when it was knocked off, and he said thank you, excited as he undoubtedly was under his frigid exterior, notwithstanding the little misadventure mentioned between the cup and the lip. What's bred in the bone? Still, as regards return, you were a lucky dog if they didn't set the terrier at you directly you got back. Then a lot of shilly-shally usually followed, Tom Four and Dick and Harry against. And then, number one, you came up against the man in possession, and had to produce your credentials like the claimant in the Titchborne case. Roger Charles Titchborne, Bella was the boat's name, to the best of his recollection, he, the heir, went down in as the evidence went to show, and there was a tattoo mark, too, on in, in Indian ink. Lord Bellew, was it, as he might very easily have picked up the details from some pal on board ship, and then, when he got up to tally with a description given, introduced himself with, excuse me, now my name is so-and-so or some such common, commonplace remark. A more prudent course, as Bloom said, to the not over-effusive, in fact like the distinguished personage under discussion beside him, 
would have been to sound the lie of the land first. That bitch, that English whore, did for him, the Shebeen proprietor commented. She put the first nail in his coffin. Fine lump of a woman all the same, the soi-disant town clerk Henry Campbell remarked, and plenty of her. She loosened many a man's thighs. I've seen her pictures in a barber's. The husband was a captain or an officer. Ay, Skin the Goat amusingly added, he was in a cotton ball one. This gratuitous contribution of a humorous character occasioned a fair amount of laughter among his entourage. As regards Bloom, he, without the faintest suspicion of a smile, merely gazed in the direction of the door and reflected upon the historic story which had aroused extraordinary interest at the time when the facts, to make matters worse, were made public with the usual affectionate letters that passed between them full of sweet nothings. First it was strictly platonic, till nature intervened, and an attachment sprang up between them, till bit by bit matters came to a climax, and the matter became the talk of the town till the staggering blow came as a welcome intelligence to not a few evil disposed, however, who were resolved upon encompassing his downfall, though the thing was public property all along, though not to anything like the sensational extent that it subsequently blossomed into. Since their names were coupled, though, since he was her declared favourite, where was the particular necessity to, to proclaim it to the rank and file from the housetops, the fact, namely, that he had shared her bedroom, which came out at, in the witness-box on oath, when a thrill went through the packed court, literally electrifying everybody in the shape of witnesses, swearing to having witnessed him on such and such a particular date, in the act of scrambling out of an upstairs apartment, with the assistance of a ladder in night apparel, having gained admittance in the same fashion, a fact the weeklies, addicted to the lubric a little, simply coin shoals of money out of. Whereas the simple fact of the case was it was simply a case of the husband not being up to the scratch, which nothing in common between them beyond the name, and then a real man arriving on the scene, strong to the verge of weakness, falling a victim to her siren charms, and forgetting home ties, the usual sequel, to bask in the loved one's smiles. The eternal question of the life connubial, needless to say, cropped up. Can real love, supposing there happens to be another chap in the case, exist between married folk? Poser! Though it was not no concern of theirs, absolutely, if he regarded her with affection, carried away by a wave of folly. A magnificent specimen of manhood, he was truly augmented, obviously, by gifts of a high order, as compared with the other military supernumerary, that is, who was just the usual everyday farewell, my gallant captain kind of an individual, in the light dragoons, the eighteenth hussars to be accurate, and inflammable doubtless, the fallen leader, that is, not the other, in his own peculiar way, which she, of course, woman, quickly perceived as highly likely to carve his way to fame, which he almost bid fair to do, till the priests and ministers of the gospel as a whole, his erstwhile staunch adherents, and his beloved evicted tenants, for whom he had done yeoman service in the rural parts of the country, by taking up the cudgels on their behalf, in a way that exceeded most their most sanguine expectations, very effectually cooked his matrimonial goose, thereby heaping coals of fire on his head, much in the same way as the fabled ass's kick. Looking back now, in a retrospective kind of arrangement, all seemed a kind of dream. And then coming back was the worst thing you ever did, because it went without saying you would feel out of place as things moved away, moved, always moved with the times. Why, as he reflected, Irish Town Strand, a locality had not been in for quite a number of years, looked different somehow since, as it happened, he went to reside on the north side. North or south, however, it was just the well-known case of hot passion, pure and simple. 
upsetting the apple cart with a vengeance, and just bore out the very thing he was saying as she also was Spanish, or half so, types that wouldn't do things by halves, passionate abandon of the South, casting every shred of decency to the winds. Just bears out what I was saying, he with glowing bosom said to Stephen, about blood and the sun, and if I don't greatly mistake, she was Spanish too. The king of Spain's daughter, Stephen answered, adding something or other rather muddled about farewell and adieu to you Spanish onions, and the first land called the dead man and the ram head to Silly was so and so many. Was she? Bloom ejaculated, surprised, though not astonished by any means, if never heard that rumour before. Possibly, especially there, it was as she lived there. So, Spain. Carefully avoiding a book in his pocket sweets, of which reminded him, by the by, of that cap one street library book out of date, he took out his pocket book and, turning over the various contents, it contained rapidly, finally, he. Do you consider, by the way, he said, thoughtfully selecting a faded photo which he laid on the table, that a Spanish type? Stephen, obviously addressed, looking down on the photo showing a large-sized lady with her fleshy charms on evidence in an open fashion as she was in the full bloom of womanhood in evening dress cut ostentatiously low for the occasion to give a liberal display of bosom with more than vision of breasts, her full lips parted and some perfect teeth standing near, ostensibly with, gra with gravity, a piano on the rest of which was an old Madrid, a ballad pretty in its way, which was then all the vogue. Her, the lady's, eyes, dark, large, looked at Stephen, about to smile about something to be admired. Lafayette of Westmoreland Street, Dublin's premier photographic artist, being responsible for the aesthetic execution. Mrs. Bloom, my wife, the prima donna, Madame Marion Tweedy, Bloom indicated, taken a few years since, in or about ninety-six, very like her then. Beside the young man he looked also at the photo of the lady now, his legal wife, who, he intimated, was the accomplished daughter of Major Brian Tweedy, and displayed at an early age remarkable proficiency as a singer, having even made her bow to the public, when her years numbered barely sweet sixteen. As for the face, it was a speaking likeness in expression, but it did not do justice to her figure, which came in for a lot of notice usually, and which did not come out to the best advantage in that get-up. She could, without difficulty, he said, have posed for the ensemble, not to dwell on certain opulent curves of the... He dwelt, being a bit of an artist in his spare time, on the female form in general developmentally, because, as it so happened, no later than the afternoon he had seen those Grecian statues, perfectly developed as works of art, in the National Museum. Marble could give the original, shoulders back, all the symmetry, all the rest. Yes, Puritanisme. It does, though, St. Joseph's sovereign thievery a law, bandé. Finne toi trop. Whereas no photo could, because it simply wasn't art, in a word. The spirit moving him he would have much liked to follow Jack Tarr's good example and leave the likeness there for a few minutes to speak for itself on the plea he, so that the other, could drink in the beauty for himself, her stage presence being, frankly, a treat in itself which the camera could not at all do justice to. But it was scarcely professional etiquette so. Though it was a warm, pleasant sort of a night, now yet wonderfully cool for the season considering, for sunshine after storm. And he did feel a kind of need there and then to follow suit, like a kind of inward voice, and satisfy a possible need by moving emotion. Nevertheless he sat tight, 
viewing the slightly soiled photo, creased by opulent curves, none the worse for wear, however, and looked away thoughtfully with the intention of not further increasing the other's possible embarrassment while gauging her symmetry of heaving ambon point. In fact, the slight soiling was only an added charm, like the case of linen slightly soiled, good as new, much better, in fact, with a starch out. Suppose she was gone when he... I looked for a lamp, which she told me came into his mind, but merely as a passing fancy of his, because he then recollected the morning littered bed, etc., and the book about Ruby, which met him, Pike Horses, sick, in which must have fell down sufficiently appropriately beside the domestic chamber pot, with apologies to Lindley Murray. The vicinity of the young man he certainly relished, educated, distingué, and impulsive into the bargain, far and away the pick of the bunch, though you wouldn't think he had it in him, yet he would. Besides, he said, the picture was handsome, which, say what you like, it was, though at the moment, she was distinctly stouter. And why not? An awful lot of make-believe went on about that sort of thing, involving a lifelong slur, with the usual splash page of gutter press about the same old matrimonial tangle, alleging misconduct with professional golfer or the newest stage favourite, instead of being honest and above board about all the about the whole business. How they were fated to meet and an attachment sprang up between the two, so that their names were coupled in the public eye, was told in court with letters containing the habitual mushy and compromising expressions, leaving no loophole to show that they openly cohabitated two or three times a week at some well-known seaside hotel, and relations, when the thing ran its normal course, became in due course intimate. Then the decree Nisi, and the king's proctor tries to show course, why, and he failing to, to quash it, Nisi was made absolute. But as for that the two misdemeanants, wrapped up as they largely were in one another, could safely afford to ignore it, as they very largely did, till the matter was put in the hands of a solicitor, who filed a petition for the party wronged in due course. He, B, enjoyed the distinction of being close to Erin's uncrowned king in the flesh, when the thing occurred in the historic fracas, when the falling leaders, who notoriously stuck out his guns, to the last drop even when clothed in the mantle of adultery, leaders, trusty henchmen, to the number of ten or a dozen or possibly even more than that penetrated into the printing works of the insuppressible, or no, it was United Ireland, a by no means by the by appropriate appellative, and broke up the typecases with hammers or something like that, all on account of some scurrilous effusions from the facile pens of the O'Brienite scribes at the usual mudslinging occupation, reflecting on the erstwhile tribune's private morals. Though palpably a radically altered man, he was still a commanding figure, though carelessly garbed, as usual, with that look of settled purpose, which went a long way into the shilly shallyers till they discovered, to their vast discomfiture, that their idol had feet of clay after placing him upon a pedestal, which she, however, was the first to perceive. As those were particularly hot times in the general hullabaloo, Bloom sustained a minor injury from a nasty prod of some chap's elbow in the crowd, that of course congregated, lodging some place about the pit of the stomach, fortunately not of a grave character. His hat, Parnell's, a silk one, was inadvertently knocked off, and, as a matter of strict history, Bloom was the man who picked it up in the crush after witnessing the occurrence meaning to return it to him, and return it to him he did with the utmost celerity, who, panting and hatless, and whose thoughts were miles away from his hat at the time, all the same being a gentleman born with a stake in the country, he, as a matter of fact, having gone into it more for the kudos of the thing than anything else, what's bred in the bone instilled into him 
in infancy at his mother's knee in the shape of knowing what good form was come out at once, because he turned round to the donor and thanked him with perfect aplomb, saying, Thank you, sir. Though in a very different tone of voice from the ornament of the legal profession, whose headgear Bloom also set to rights earlier in the course of the day, history repeating itself with a difference. After the burial of a mutual friend, when they had left him alone in his glory, after the grim task of having committed his remains to the grave. On the other hand, what incensed him more inwardly was the blatant jokes of the cabman, and so on, who passed it all off as a jest, laughing immoderately, pretending to understand everything, the why and the wherefore, and in reality not knowing their own minds, it being a case for the two parties themselves, unless it ensued that the illegitimate husband happened to be a party to it, owing to some anonymous letter from the usual boy Jones, who happened to come across them at the crucial moment in a loving position, locked in one another's arms, drawing attention to their illicit proceedings and leading up to a domestic rumpus, and the erring fair one begging forgiveness of her lord and master upon her knees, and promising to sever the connection, and not receive his visits any more, if only the aggrieved husband would overlook the matter, and let bygones be bygones, with tears in her eyes, though possibly with her tongue and her fair cheek at the same time, as quite possibly there were several others. He personally, being of a sceptical bias, believed, and didn't make the smallest bones about saying so, either that man or men, in the plural, were always hanging around on the waiting list about a lady, even supposing she was the best wife in the world, and they got on fairly well together for the sake of argument, when, neglecting her duties, she chose to be tired of wedded life, and was on for a little flutter in polite debauchery, to press their attentions on her with improper intent, the upshot being that her affections centred on another. The cause of many liaisons between still attractive married women getting on for fair and forty, and younger men, no doubt as several famous cases of feminine infatuation, proved up to the hilt. It was a thousand pities a young fellow, blessed with an allowance of brains, as his neighbour obviously was, should waste his valuable time with profligate women who might present him with a nice dose to last him his lifetime. In the nature of single blessedness, he would one day take unto himself a wife when Miss Wright came on the scene, but in the interim ladies' society was a conditio sine qua non, though he had the gravest possible doubts that he not that he wanted in the smallest to pump Stephen about Miss Ferguson, who was very possibly the particular lodestar who brought him down to Irish Town so early in the morning, as to whether he would find much satisfaction basking in the boy and girl courtship idea, and the company of smirking misses, without a penny to their names, buy or try weekly, with the orthodox preliminary canter of compliment playing, and walking out leading up to fond lover's way and flowers and trocks. To think of him, house and homeless, rooked by some landlady worse than any stepmother, was really too bad at his age. The queer suddenly things he popped out with attracted the elder man, who was several years the other's senior, or like his father, but something substantial he certainly ought to eat, even were it only an egg-flip, made on unadulterated maternal nutriment, or, failing that, the homely Humpty Dumpty boiled. "'And what o'clock did you dine?' he questioned of the slim form and tired, though unwrinkled, face. "'Sometime yesterday,' Stephen said. "'Yesterday!' exclaimed Bloom, till he remembered it was already to-morrow Friday. "'Ah, you mean it's after twelve? "'The day before yesterday.' Stephen said, improving on himself. Literally astounded at this piece of intelligence, Bloom reflected. Though they didn't see eye to eye in everything, a certain analogy there somehow was, as if both their minds were travelling, so to speak, in the one train of thought. 
At his age, when dabbling in politics roughly some score of years previously, when he had been a quasi-aspirant to parliamentary honours in the buckshot foster days, he too recollected in retrospect, which was a source of keen satisfaction in itself. He had a sneaking regard for those same ultra-ideas. For instance, when the evicted tenants question, then at its first inception, bulked largely in people's minds, though, it goes without saying, not contributing a copper or pinning his faith absolutely to its dictums, some of which wouldn't exactly hold water, he, at the outset, at all events, was in thorough sympathy with peasant possession as voicing the trend of modern opinion, a partiality, however, which, realising his mistake, he was subsequently partially cured of, and even was twitted with going a step farther than Michael David in the striking views he at one time inculcated as a back to the lander, which was one reason he strongly resented the innuendo put upon him in so barefaced a fashion by our friend at the gathering of the clans in Barney Kiernan's, so that he, though often considerably misunderstood, and the least pugnacious of mortals, be it repeated, departed from his customary habit to give him, metaphorically, one in the gizzard, though, as far as politics themselves were concerned, he was only too conscious of the mutual animosity and the misery and suffering it entailed as a foregone conclusion of fine young fellows, chiefly destruction of the fittest, in a word. Anyhow, upon weighing up the pros and cons, getting on for one as it was, it was high time to be retiring for the night. The crux was it was a bit risky to bring him home, as eventualities might possibly ensue, somebody having a temper of her own sometimes, and spoil the hash altogether, as on the night he misguidedly brought home a dog, breed unknown, with a lame paw. Not that the cases were either identical or the reverse, though he had hurt his hand, too. To Ontario Terrace, as he very distinctly remembered having been there, so to speak. On the other hand, it was altogether far and away too late for the Sandy Mount or Sandy Cove suggestion, so that he was in some perplexity as to which of the two alternatives. Everything pointed to the fact that it behoved him to avail himself to the full of the opportunity, all things considered. His initial impression was he was a shade standoffish or not over-effusive, but it grew on him some way. For one thing he mightn't what you call jump at the idea, if approached, and what mostly worried him was he didn't know how to lead up to it, or word it exactly, supposing he did entertain the proposal, as it would afford him very great personal pleasure if he would allow him to help out to help to put coin in his way, or some wardrobe, if found suitable. At all events, he wound up by concluding, as giving for the nonce high-bound precedent, a cup of Epps cocoa and a shakedown for the night, plus the use of a rug or two, and overcoat doubled into a pillow, at least he would be in safe hands, and as warm as a toast on a trivet, if he failed to perceive any very vast amount of harm in that always, with a proviso no rumpus of any sort was kicked up. A move had to be made, because that merry old soul, the grass widower in question, who appeared to be glued to the spot, didn't appear in any particular hurry to wend his way home to the dearly beloved Queenstown, and it was highly likely some sponge's bawdy house of retired beauties, where age was no bar off Sheriff Street lower, would be the best clue to that equivocal character's whereabouts for a few days to come, alternately racking their feelings, the mermaids, with six-chamber revolver and anecdotes verging on the tropical, calculated to freeze the marrow of anybody's bones and mauling their large-sized charms between whiles with rough and tumble gusto to the accompaniment of large potations of potteen and the usual blarney about himself as to who he in reality was, let X equal my right name and address, as Mr. Algebra remarks pass him. At the same time he inwardly chuckled over his gentle repartee to the 
blood and ounds champion about his god being a Jew. People could put up with being bitten by a wolf, but what properly riled them was a bite from a sheep. The most vulnerable point, too, of tender Achilles. Your god was a Jew, because mostly they appeared to imagine he came from Carrick-on-Shannon, or somewhereabouts in the county Sligo. I propose, our hero eventually suggested, after mature reflection, while prudently pocketing her photo, as it's rather stuffy here, you just come home with me and talk things over. My diggings are quite close in the vicinity. You can't drink that stuff. Do you like cocoa? Wait, I'll just pay this lot. The best plan clearly being to clear out, the remainder being plain sailing, he beckoned, while prudently pocketing the photo, to the keeper of the shanty who didn't seem to. Yes, that's the best, he assured Stephen, to whom for the matter of that brazen head or him or anywhere else was all more or less. All kinds of utopian plans were flashing through his, B's, busy brain. In the education, the genuine article, literature, journalism, prize tidbits, up-to-date billing, concert tours in English watering resorts packed with hydros and seaside theatres, turning money away, duets in Italian, with the accent perfectly true to nature, and a quantity of other things, no necessity, of course, to tell the world and, the, and his wife from the housetops about it, and a slice of luck. An opening was all was wanted. Because he more than suspected, he had his father's voice to bank his hopes on, which it was quite on the cards he had, so it would be just as well, by the way, no harm, to trail the conversation in the direction of that particular red herring just too. The cabby read out of the paper he had got hold of that the former viceroy, Earl Cadogan, had presided at the cab driver's association dinner in London somewhere. Silence with a yawn or two accompanied this thrilling announcement. Then the old specimen in the corner, who appeared to have some spark of vitality left, read out that Sir Anthony MacDonald had left Euston for the chief secretary's lodge or words to that effect. To which absorbing piece of intelligence Echo answered why? Give us a squint at that literature, Grandfather, the ancient mariner put in, manifesting some natural impatience. And welcome, answered the elderly parties thus addressed. The sailor lugged out from a case he had a pair of greenish goggles, which he very slowly hooked over his nose and both ears. Are you bad in the eyes? The sympathetic personage, like the town clerk, queried. Why? answered the seafarer with a tartan beard, who seemingly was a bit of a literary cove in his own small way, staring out of sea-green potholes, as you might well describe them as. I use as goggles reading. Sand in the Red Sea done that. One time I could read a book in the dark, manner of speaking. The Arabian Nights Entertainment was my favourite, and red as a rose is she. Hereupon he poured the journal open and poured upon Lord only knows what, found drowned, or the exploits of King Willow, Ironmonger, having made a hundred and something second wicket not out for knots, during which time, completely regardless of ire, the keeper was intensely occupied, loosening an apparently new or second-hand boot, which manifestly pinched him as he muttered against whoever it was sold it, all of them who were sufficiently awake enough to be picked out by their facial expressions, that is to say, either simply going on glumly or passing a trivial, a trivial remark. To cut a long story short, Bloom, grasping the situation, was the first to rise from his seat, so as not to outstay their welcome, having first and foremost, being as good as his word, that he would foot the bill for the occasion, taking the wise precaution to unobtrusively motion to mine host, as a parting shot a scarcely perceptible sign, when the others were not looking, to the effect that the amount due was forthcoming. 
making a grand total of fourpence, the amount he deposited unobtrusively in four coppers, literally the last of the Mohicans. He having previously spotted on the printed price list for all who ran to read opposite him in unmistakable figures, coffee two d, confectionery do, and honestly well worth twice the money once in a way, as Weatherup used to remark. Come, he counselled to close the séance. Seeing that the ruse worked and the coast was clear, they left the shelter or shanty together and the elite society of oilskin and company whom nothing short of an earthquake would move out of their dolce far niente. Stephen, who confessed to still feeling poorly and fagged out, paused at the, for a moment, the door. One thing I never understand, he said, to be original on the spur of the moment. Why they put tables upside down at night, I mean chairs upside down, on the tables and cafes. To which impromptu the never-failing Bloom replied, without a moment's hesitation, saying straight off, to sweep the floor in the morning. So saying, he skipped around, nimbly considering, frankly at the same time apologetic, to get on his companion's right, a habit of his, by the by, his right side being, on, in classical idiom, his tender Achilles. The night air was certainly now a treat to breathe, though Stephen was a bit weak on his pins. "'It will, the air, do you good,' Bloom said, meaning also the walk, in a moment. "'The only thing is to walk, then you'll feel a different man. Come, it's not far. Lean on me.' Accordingly, he passed his left arm in Stephen's right, and led him on accordingly. Yes, Stephen said uncertainly, because he thought he felt a strange kind of flesh of a different man approach him, sinewless and wobbly and all that. Anyhow, they passed the sentry box with stones, brazier, etc., where the municipal supernumerary, ex Gumley, was still to all intents and purposes wrapped in the arms of Murphy, at the adage has it, dreaming of fresh fields and pastures new. And apropos of coffin, of stones, the analogy was not at all bad, as it was in fact a stoning to death on the part of seventy-two out of eighty-odd constituencies that ratted at the time of the split, and chiefly the belauded peasant class, probably the self-same evicted tenants he had put in their holdings. So they turned on to chatting about music, a form of art for which Bloom, as a pure amateur, possessed the greatest love, as they made tracks arm in arm across Beresford Place. Wagnerian music, though confessedly grand in its way, was a bit too heavy for Bloom, and hard to follow at the first go-off, but the music of Mercadante's Huguenots Meyerbeer's Seven Last Words, or the cross and Mozart's Twelfth Mass, he simply reveled in. The Gloria in that being, to his mind, the acme of first-class music as such, literally knocking everything else into a cocked hat. He infinitely preferred the sacred music of the Catholic Church to anything the opposite shop could offer in that line, such as those moody and sanky hymns, or bid me to live, and I will live thy Protestant to be. He also yielded to none in his admiration of Rossini's Stabat Mater, a work simply abounding in immortal numbers, in which his wife, Madame Marion Tweedy, made a hit, a veritable sensation, he might safely say, greatly adding to her other laurels, and putting the others totally in the shade, in the Jesuit Father's Church in Upper Gardener Street, the sacred er edifice being thronged to the door, to hear her with virtuosos, a virtuosi, rather. There was the unanimous opinion that there was none to come up to her, and suffice it to say, in a place of worship for music of a sacred character, there was a generally voiced desire for an encore. On the whole, though favouring preferably light opera of the Don Giovanni description, and Martha, a gem in its line, 
he had a penchant, though with only a surface knowledge, for the severe classical school such as Mendelssohn. And talking of that, taking it for granted, he knew all about the old favourites. He mentioned par excellence, Lionel's heir and Martha, Mapari, which, curiously enough, he had heard, or overheard, to be more accurate, on yesterday, a privilege he keenly appreciated, from the lips of Stephen's respected father, sung to perfection, a study of the number, in fact, which made all the others take a back seat. Stephen, in reply to a politely put query, said he didn't sing it, but launched out into praises of Shakespeare's songs, at least of, in or about that period, the lutinist Dowland, who lived in Fetter Lane near Gerard, the herbalist, whose Anoludendu Hausi, Dulandus, an instrument he was con contemplating purchasing from Mr. Ar Arnold Dolmetsch, whom B. did not quite recall, though the name certainly sounded familiar, for sixty-five guineas, and Farnaby and Son with their ducks and combs, conceits, and Bird, William, who played the virginals, he said, in the Queen's Chapel, or anywhere else he found them, and one Tomkins, who made toys or airs, and John Bull. On the roadway which they were approaching, whilst still speaking beyond the swing-chains, a horse, dragging a sweeper, paced on the paven ground, brushing a long swathe of mire, up so that, with a noise, Bloom was not perfectly certain whether he had caught aright the allusion to sixty-five guineas and John Bull. He inquired if it was John Bull, the political celebrity of that ilk, as it struck him the two identical names as a striking coincidence. By the chains the horse slowly swerved to turn, which, perceiving Bloom, who was keeping a sharp lookout as usual, plucked the other's, sleeve, the other's sleeve gently, jocosely remarking, Our lives are in peril tonight. Beware of the steam-roller. They thereupon stopped. Bloom looked at the head of a horse not worth anything like sixty-five guineas, suddenly in evidence in the dark, quite near, so that it seemed new, a different grouping of bones and even flesh, because palpably it was a forewalker, a hip-shaker, a black buttocker, a tail dangler, a head hanger, putting his hind foot foremost, the while the lord of his creation sat on the perch, busy with his thoughts. But such a good poor brute, he was sorry he hadn't a lump of sugar, but, as he wisely reflected, he could scarcely be prepared for every emergency that might crop up. He was just a bit ner big, nervous, foolish, noodly kind of a horse, without a second care in the world. But even a dog, he reflected, take that mongrel of Barney Kiernan's of the same size, would be a holy horror to face. But it was no animal's fault in particular, if he was built that way, like the camel, ship of the desert, distilling grapes into potheen in his hump. Nine-tenths of them all could be caged or trained, nothing beyond the art of man barring the bees. Whale with a harpoon hairpin, alligator tickled the small of his back, and he sees the joke. Chalk a circle for a rooster, tiger my eagle eye. These timely reflections anent the brutes of the field occupied his mind, somewhat distracted from Stephen's words, while the ship of the street was manoeuvring, and Stephen went on about the highly interesting old What's this I was saying? Ah, yes, my wife, he intimated, plunging in medias rays, would have the greatest of pleasure in making your acquaintance, as she is passionately attached to music of any kind. He looked sideways in a friendly fashion at the side face of Stephen, image of his mother, which was not quite the same as the usual handsome blackguard type they unquestionably had an insatiable hankering after as he was perhaps not that way built. Still, supposing he had his father's gift, as he, 
more than suspected, it opened up new vistas in his mind, such as Lady Fingal's Irish Industries, concert on the preceding Monday, and aristocracy in general. Exquisite variations he was now describing on an air Youth Here Has End by Jans Peter Swielink, a Dutchman of Amsterdam, where the Fraus came from. Even more he liked an old German song of Johannes Jeep about the clear sea and the voices of sirens, sweet murderers of men, which boggled Bloom a bit. Von der Sirenen Listigkeit tun die Poeten dichten. These opening bars he sang and translated extempore. Bloom, nodding, said he perfectly understood and begged him to go on by all means, which he did. A phenomenally beautiful tenor voice like that, the rarest of boons, which Bloom appreciated at the first note he got out, could easily, if properly handled by some recognized authority in voice production, such as Barraclough, and being able to read music into the bargain, command its own price, where baritones were ten a penny, and procure for its fortunate possessor, in the near future, an entree into fashionable houses in the best residential quarters of financial magnates, in the large way of business and titled people, where, with his university degree of B.A., a huge ad in its way, and gentlemanly bearing to all the more influence, the good impression he would infallibly score a distinct success, being blessed with brains, which also could be utilized for the purpose and other requisites, if his clothes were properly attended to, so as to the better worm his way into their good graces, as he, a youthful tyro in society's sartorial niceties, hardly understood how a little thing like that could militate against you. It was in fact only a matter of months, and he could easily foresee him participating in their musical and artistic conversaciones during the festive festivities of the Christmas season, for choice, causing a slight flutter in the dovecotes of the fair sex, and being made a lot of by the ladies out for sensation, cases of which, as he happened to know, were on record. In fact, Without giving the show away, he himself, once upon a time, if he cared to, could easily have. Added to which, of course, would be the pecuniary emolument, by no means to be sneezed at, going hand in hand with his tuition fees. Not, he parenthesized, that for the sake of filthy lucre he need necessarily embrace the lyric platform as a walk in life for any lengthy space of time but a step in the required direction, it was beyond yea or nay, and both monetarily and mentally it contained no reflection on his dignity in the smallest, and it often turned in uncommonly handy to be handed a cheque at a much-needed moment when every little helped. Besides, though taste latterly had deteriorated to a degree, original music like that, different from the conventional rut, would rapidly have a great vogue, as it would be decided novelty for Dublin's musical world, after the usual hackneyed run of catchy tenor solos, foisted on a confiding public by Ivan St. Austell and Hilton St. Just and their genus omne. Yes, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he could, with all the cards in his hand, and he had a capital opening to make a name for himself and win a high place in the city's esteem, where he could command a stiff figure, and, booking ahead, giving a grand concert for the patrons of the King Street house, given a backer-up, if one were forthcoming to kick him upstairs, so to speak, a big if, however, with some impetus of the goat-head sort, to obviate the inevitable procrastination which often tripped up a too-much-fated prince of good fellows and it need not detract from the other by one iota, as, being his own master, he would have heaps of time to practice literature in his spare moments, when desirous of so doing, without its clashing with a vocal career, or containing anything derogatory whatsoever, as it was a matter for himself alone. 
In fact, he had the ball at his feet, and was the very reason why the other, possessed of a remarkably sharp nose for smelling a rat of any sort, hung on to him at all. The horse was just then, and later on, at a propitious opportunity, he purposed, Bloom did, without any way prying into his private affairs, on the fool's step in where angels principal, advising him to sever his connection with a certain budding practitioner, who, he noticed, was prone to disparage, and even to a slight extent, with some hilarious pretext when not present, deprecate him, or whatever you like to call it, in which Bloom's humble opinion threw a nasty sidelight on that side of a person's character, no pun intended. The horse, having reached the end of his tether, so to speak, halted, and rearing high a proud feathering tail, added his quota by letting fall on the floor, which the brush would soon brush up and polish, three smoking globes of turds. Slowly three times, one after another, from a full crupper he mired, and humanely his driver waited till he or she had ended, patient in his scythed car. Side by side, Bloom, profiting by the contretemps, with Stephen passed through the gap of the chains, divided by the upright, and stepping over a strand of mire, went across towards Gardiner Street Lower, Stephen singing more boldly, but not loudly, the end of the ballad. Und alle Schiffe brücken. The driver never said a word, good, bad, or indifferent, but merely watched the two figures, as he sat on his low-backed car, both black, one full, one lean, walked towards the railway bridge, to be married by Father Meha. As they walked, they at times stopped and walked again, continuing their tete-a-tete, -tete, which of course he was utterly out of, about sirens, enemies of man's reason, mingled with a number of other topics of the same category, usurpers, historical cases of the kind, while the man in the sleeper car, or you might as well call it, who in any case couldn't possibly hear, because they were too far, simply sat in his seat, near the end of Lower Gardener Street, and looked after their low-backed car. End of section 16, part 3 Recorded by Gesine in Valletta, June 2006
the maleficent influence of the pre-sabbath stephen's collapse did bloom discover common factors of similarity between their respective like and unlike reactions to experience both were sensitive to artistic impressions musical in preference to plastic or pictorial both preferred a continental to an insular manner of life a cisatlantic to a transatlantic place of residence both indurated by early domestic training and an inherited tendency of heterodox resistance profess their disbelief in many orthodox religious national social and ethical doctrines both admitted the alternately stimulating and obtunding influence of heterosexual magnetism were their views on some points divergent stephen dissented openly from bloom's views on the importance of dietary and civic self-help while bloom dissented tacitly from stephen's views on the eternal affirmation of the spirit of man in literature bloom assented covertly to stephen's rectification of the anachronism involved in assigning the date of the conversion of the irish nation to christianity from druidism by patrick son of calpornus son of potitus son of odysseus sent by pope celestine the first in the year four thirty two in the reign of leary to the year two sixty or thereabouts in the reign of cormac mccart died two sixty six a d suffocated by imperfect deglutition of ailment at sledi and interred at rosnery the collapse which bloom ascribed to gastric inanition and certain chemical compounds of varying degrees of adulteration and alcoholic strength accelerated by mental exertion and the velocity of rapid circular motion in a relaxing atmosphere stephen attributed to the reapparition of a matutinal cloud perceived by both from two different points of observation sandy cove and dublin at first no bigger than a woman's hand was there one point on which their views were equal and negative? The influence of gaslight or electric light on the growth of adjoining paraheliotropic trees. Had Bloom discussed similar subjects during nocturnal perambulations in the past? In 1884, with Owen Goldberg and Cecil Turnbull at night on public thoroughfares between Longwood Avenue and Leonard's Corner, and Leonard's Corner and Sing Street, and Sing Street and Bloomfield Avenue. In 1885, with Percy Apjohn in the evenings, reclining against the wall between Gibraltar Villa and Bloomfield House in Crumlin, Barony of Uppercross in eighteen eighty six occasionally with casual acquaintances and prospective purchasers on doorsteps in front parlors in third-class railway cars of suburban lines in eighteen eighty eight frequently with major brian tweedy and his daughter miss marion tweedy together and separately on the lounge in matthew dillon's house in roundtown once in eighteen ninety two and once in eighteen ninety three with julius judah mastiansky on both occasions in the parlor of his bloom's house in lombard street west what reflection concerning the irregular sequence of dates eighteen eighty four eighteen eighty five eighteen eighty six eighteen eighty eight eighteen ninety two eighteen ninety three nineteen o four did bloom make before their arrival at their destination he reflected that the progressive extension of the field of individual development and experience was regressively accompanied by a restriction of the converse domain of inter-individual relations as in what ways from inexistence to existence he came to many and was as one received Existence with existence he was with any as any with any. From existence to non-existence, gone he would be by all as non-perceived. 
What act did Bloom make on their arrival at their destination? At the house steps of the fourth of the equidifferent uneven numbers, number seven Eccles Street, he inserted his hand mechanically into the back pocket of his trousers to obtain his latchkey. Was it there? It was in the corresponding pocket of the trousers which he had worn on the day but one preceding. Why was he doubly irritated? Because he had forgotten, and because he remembered that he had reminded himself twice not to forget. What were then the alternatives before the premeditatedly, respectively, and inadvertently keyless couple? To enter or not to enter. To knock or not to knock. Bloom's decision? A stratagem. Resting his feet on the dwarf wall, he climbed over the area railings, compressed his hat on his head, grasped two points at the lower union of rails and stiles, lowered his body gradually by its length of five feet nine inches and a half to within two feet ten inches of the area pavement and allowed his body to move freely in space by separating himself from the railings and crouching in preparation for the impact of the fall. Did he fall? By his body's known weight of eleven stone and four pounds in Avra de Poy's measure, as certified by the graduated machine for periodical self-weighing at the premises of Francis Frodman, pharmaceutical chemist of 19 Frederick Street North, on the last feast of the Ascension, to wit, the twelfth day of May of the besectile year 1904 of the Christian era. Jewish era 5,664, Mohammedan era 1,322, golden number 5, EPACT 13, solar cycle 9, dominical letters CB, Roman indication 2, Julian period 6617, MCMIV. Did he rise uninjured by concussion? Regaining new stable equilibrium, he rose uninjured, though concussed by the impact, raised the latch of the area door by the exertion of force at its freely moving flange, and by leverage of the first kind, applied at its fulcrum, gained retarded access to the kitchen through the subadjacent scullery, ignited a lucifer match by friction, set free inflammable coal gas by turning on the vent cock, lit a high flame which, by regulating, he reduced the quiescent candescence, and lit finally a portable candle. What discreet succession of images did Stephen meanwhile perceive? Reclined against the area railings, he perceived through the transparent kitchen panes a man regulating a gas flame of 14 cp, a man lighting a candle of 1 cp, a man removing in turn each of his two boots, a man leaving the kitchen holding a candle. Did the man reappear elsewhere? After a lapse of four minutes, the glimmer of his candle was discernible through the semi-transparent, semi-circular glass fanlight over the hall door. The hall door turned gradually on its hinges. In the open space of the doorway, the man reappeared without his hat, with his candle. Did Stephen obey his sign? Yes. Entering softly, he helped to close and chain the door, and followed softly along the hallway the man's back, and listed feet and lighted candle past a lighted crevice of doorway on the left, and carefully down a turning staircase of more than five steps into the kitchen of Bloom's house. What did Bloom do? He extinguished the candle by a sharp expiration of breath upon its flame drew two spoon-seat deal chairs to the hearthstone, 
one for Stephen with its back at the area window, the other for himself when necessary, knelt on one knee, composed in the grate a pyre of cross-laid resin-tipped sticks and various colored papers, and irregular polygons of best Abram coal at twenty-one shillings a ton from the yard of Messrs. Flower and MacDonald of 14 Dolliver Street, kindled it at three projected points of paper with one ignited lucifer match, thereby releasing the potential energy contained in the fuel, by allowing its carbon and hydrogen elements to enter into free union with the oxygen of the air. Of what similar apparitions did Stephen think? Of others elsewhere in other times who, kneeling on one knee or on two, had kindled fires for him. Of Brother Michael in the infirmary of the College of the Society of Jesus at Clongeswood, Salins, in the county of Kildare. Of his father, Simon Dedalus, in an unfurnished room of his first residence in Dublin, number 13 Fitzgibbon Street, of his godmother, Miss Kate Morkin, in the house of her dying sister, Miss Julia Morkin, at 15 Usher's Island, of his aunt Sarah, wife of Richie, Richard Goulding, in the kitchen of their lodgings at 62 Clanbrassel Street, of his mother Mary, wife of Simon Dedalus, in the kitchen of number 12 North Richmond Street, in the morning of the Feast of St. Francis Xavier, 1898, of the Dean of Studies, Father Butt, in the Physics Theatre of University College, 16 Stevens Green North, of his sister Dilly, Dahlia, in his father's house in Cabra. What did Stephen see on raising his gaze to the height of a yard from the fire towards the opposite wall? Under a row of five coiled spring house bells, a curvy lineal rope stretched between two holdfasts athwart across the recess beside the chimney pier, from which hung four small sized square handkerchiefs folded unattached consecutively in adjacent rectangles, and one pair of ladies' gray hose with lisle suspender tops and feet in their habitual position clamped by three erect wooden pegs, two at their outer extremities, and a third at their point of junction. What did Bloom see on the range? On the right smaller hob, a blue enameled saucepan, on the left larger hob, a black iron kettle. What did Bloom do at the range? He removed the saucepan to the left hob, rose and carried the iron kettle to the sink, in order to tap the current by turning the faucet to let it flow. Did it flow? Yes, from Roundwood Reservoir in County Wicklow of a cubic capacity of 2,400 million gallons percolating through a subterranean aqueduct of filter mains of single and double pipage constructed at an initial plant cost of five pounds per linear yard by way of the Dargle, Rathdown, Glen of the Downs, and Callow Hill, to the 26-acre reservoir at Stillorgan, a distance of 22 statute miles, and thence through a system of relieving tanks by a gradient of 250 feet to the city boundary of Eustace Bridge, Upper Leeson Street, though from prolonged summer drought and daily supply of twelve and a half million gallons, the water had fallen below the sill of the overflow ware, for which reason the borough surveyor and the waterworks engineer, Mr. Spencer Harty, C.E., on the instructions of the waterworks committee, had prohibited the use of municipal water for purposes other than those of consumption envisaging the possibility of recourse being had to the impotable water of the Grand and Royal Canals as in 1893, particularly as the South Dublin Guardians, notwithstanding their ration of fifteen gallons per day per pauper supplied through a six-inch meter, had been convicted of a wastage of twenty thousand gallons per night by a reading of their meter on the affirmation of the law agent of the corporation, 
Mr. Ignatius Rice, solicitor, thereby acting to the detriment of another section of the public, self-supporting taxpayers, solvent, sound. What in water did Bloom, water-lover, drawer of water, water-carrier, returning to the range, admire? Its universality, its democratic equality and consistency to its nature in seeking its own level, its vastness in the ocean of Mercator's projection, its unplumbed profundity in the sundam trench of the Pacific, exceeding eight thousand fathoms, the restlessness of its waves and surface particles visiting in turn all points of its seaboard, the independence of its units, the variability of states of sea, its hydrostatic quiescence in calm, its hydrokinetic turgidity in neap and spring tides, its subsidence after devastation, its sterility in the circumpolar ice caps, Arctic and Antarctic, its climactic and commercial significance, its preponderance of three to one over the dry land of the globe, its indisputable hegemony extending in square leagues over all the region below the sub-equatorial tropic of Capricorn, the multi-secular stability of its primal basin, its Ludi Olfavus bed, its capacity to dissolve and hold in solution all soluble substances, including millions of tons of the most precious metals, its slow erosions of peninsulas and islands, its persistent formation of homeothetic islands, peninsulas, and downward-tending promontories, its alluvial deposits, its weight and volume and density, its imperturbability in lagoons and highland tarns, its graduation of colors in the torrid and temperate and frigid zones, its vehicular ramifications in continental lake-contained streams and confluent ocean-flowing rivers with their tributaries and transoceanic currents, gulf streams, north and south equatorial courses, its violence in sea-quakes, water spouts, artesian wells, eruptions, torrents, eddies, freshets, spates, ground swells, watersheds, water partings, geysers, cataracts, whirlpools, maelstroms, inundations, deluges, cloudbursts. Its vast circumterrestrial a horizontal curve, its secrecy in springs and latent humidity, revealed by rhabdomantic or hygrometric instruments and exemplified by the well by the hole in the wall at ashtown gate saturation of air distillation of dew the simplicity of its composition two constituent parts of hydrogen and one constituent part of oxygen its healing virtues its buoyancy in the waters of the dead sea its persevering penetrativeness in runnels gullies inadequate dams leaks on shipboard its properties for cleansing, quenching thirsts and fire, nourishing vegetation, its infallibility as paradigm and paragon, its metamorphosis as vapor, mist, cloud, rain, sleet, snow, hail, its strength in rigid hydrants, its variety of forms in loch and bays and gulfs and bites and guts and lagoons and atolls and archipelagos and sounds and fjords and minches and tidal estuaries and arms of sea its solidity in glaciers icebergs ice flows its docility in working hydraulic mill wheels turbines dynamos electric power stations bleach works tanneries scutch mills its utility in canals, rivers, if navigable, floating and graving docks, its potentiality derivable from harnessed tides of watercourses falling from level to level, its submarine fauna and flora, an acoustic photophobe, numerically if not literally the inhabitants of the globe, its ubiquity as constituting 90% of the human body, the noxiousness of its effluvia in lacustrine marshes, pestilential fens, faded flower water, stagnant pools in the waning moon. 
Having set the half-filled kettle on the now-burning coals, why did he return to the still-flowing tap? To wash his soiled hands with a partially consumed tablet of Barrington's lemon-flavored soap, to which paper still adhered, bought thirteen hours previously for fourpence and still unpaid for, in fresh cold, never-changing, ever-changing water and dry them, face and hands, in a long red-bordered holland cloth passed over a wooden revolving roller. What reason did Stephen give for declining Bloom's offer? That he was a hydrophobe, hating partial contact by immersion or total by submersion in cold water, his last bath having taken place in the month of October of the preceding years, disliking the aqueous substances of glass and crystal, distrusting aquicities of thought and language. What impeded Bloom from giving Stephen counsel of hygiene and prophylactic, to which should be added suggestions concerning a preliminary wetting of the head and contraction of the muscles with rapid splashing of the face and neck and thoracic and epigastric region in case of sea or river bathing, and parts of the human anatomy most sensitive to cold being the nape, stomach, thener, or sole of foot. The incompatibility of aquacity with the erratic originality of genius. What additional didactic counsels did he similarly repress? Dietary, concerning the respective percentage of protein and caloric energy in bacon, saltling, and butter, the absence of the former in the last named, and the abundance of the latter in the first named. Which seemed to the host to be the predominant qualities of his guest? Confidence in himself, an equal and opposite power of abandonment and recuperation. What concomitant phenomena took place in the vessel of liquid by the agency of fire? The phenomenon was ebullition, fanned by a constant updraft of ventilation between the kitchen and the chimney flue. Ignition was communicated from the faggots of precombustible fuel to polyhedral masses of bituminous coal, containing in compressed mineral form the foliated fossilized decidua of primal forests, which had in turn derived their vegetative existence from the sun, primal source of heat, radiant, transmitted through omnipresent luminiferous diatherminous ether, heat, convected, a mode of motion developed by such combustion was constantly and increasingly conveyed from the source of calorification to the liquid contained in the vessel, being radiated through the uneven, unpolished dark surface of the metal iron, in part reflected, in part absorbed, in part transmitted, gradually raising the temperature of the water from normal to boiling point a rise in temperature expressible as the result of an expenditure of 72 thermal units needed to raise one pound of water from 50 degrees to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. What announced the accomplishment of this rise in temperature? A double falciform ejection of water vapor from under the kettle lid at both sides simultaneously. For what personal purpose could Bloom have applied the water so boiled? To shave himself. What advantages attended shaving by night? A softer beard, a softer brush if intentionally allowed to remain from shave to shave in its agglutinated lather, a softer skin if unexpectedly encountering female acquaintances in remote places in uncustomary hours quiet reflections upon the course of the day, a cleaner sensation when awakening after a fresher sleep, since matitudinal noises, premonitions and perturbations, a clattered milk can, a postman's double knock, a paper read, re-read while lathering, re-lathering the same spot, a shock, a shoot, with thought of aught he sought, though fraught with naught might cause a faster rate of shaving, and a nick on which incision plaster with precision cut and humected and applied adhered, which was to be done. 
Why did absence of light disturb him less than presence of noise? Because of the surety of the sense of touch in his firm, full, masculine, feminine, passive, active hand. What did it, his hand, possess, but with what counteracting influence? The operative surgical quality, but that he was reluctant to shed human blood, even when the end justified the means, preferring in their natural order heliotherapy, psychophysicotherapeutics, osteopathic surgery. What lay under exposure on the lower, middle, and upper shelves of the kitchen dresser, opened by Bloom? On the lower shelf, five vertical breakfast plates, six horizontal breakfast saucers on which rested inverted breakfast cups, a mustache cup uninverted and saucer of crown derby, four white gold-rimmed egg cups, an open chamois purse displaying coins, mostly copper, and a vial of aromatic violet comfits. On the middle shelf, a chipped egg cup containing pepper, a drum of table salt, four conglomerated black olives in oleaginous paper, an empty pot of plum trees potted meat, an oval wicker basket bedded with fiber and containing one jersey pear, a half-empty bottle of William Gilby and Company's white invalid port, half disrobed of its swathe of coral pink tissue paper, a packet of Epps soluble cocoa, five ounces of Ann Lynch's choice tea at two shillings per pound in a crinkled lead paper bag, a cylindrical canister containing the best crystallized lump sugar, two onions, one the larger Spanish, entire, the other smaller Irish, bisected with augmented surface and more redolent, a jar of Irish model dairies cream, a jug of brown crockery containing a nagin and a quarter of soured adulterated milk, converted by heat into water, a sigillous serum and semi-solidified curds, which added to the quantity subtracted for Mr. Bloom's and Mrs. Fleming's breakfasts, made one imperial pint, the total quantity originally delivered, two cloves, a halfpenny, and a small dish containing a slice of fresh rib steak. On the upper shelf, a battery of jam jars, empty, of various sizes and provenances. What attracted his attention lying on the apron of the dresser? Four polygonal fragments of two lacerated scarlet bedding tickets, numbered 887, 886. What reminiscences temporarily corrugated his brow? Reminiscences of coincidences, truth stranger than fiction, pre-indicative of the result of the gold cup flat handicap, the official and definite results of which he had read in the evening telegram, late pink edition, in the cabman shelter at Butt Bridge. Where had previous intimations of the result, affected or projected, been received by him? In Bernard Kierman's licensed premise, 8, 9, and 10, Little Britain Street, in David Byrne's licensed premise, 14 Duke Street, in O'Connell Street Lower, outside Graham Lemons, when a dark man had placed in his hand a throwaway, subsequently thrown away, advertising Elijah, restorer of the Church of Zion, in Lincoln Place, outside the premises of F. W. Sweeney and Company Limited, dispensing chemists, when Frederick M. Bantam Lyons had rapidly and successively requested, perused, and reconstituted the copy of the current issue of the Freeman's Journal and National Press, which he had been about to throw away, subsequently thrown away, he had proceeded towards the oriental edifice of the Turkish and Warm Baths, 11 Leinster Street, with the light of inspiration shining in his countenance and bearing in his arms the secret of the race, graven in the language of prediction. What qualifying considerations allayed his perturbations? 
the difficulties of interpretation since the significance of any event followed its occurrence as variably as the acoustic report followed the electrical discharge and counterestimating against an actual loss by failure to interpret the total sum of possible losses preceding originally from a successful interpretation his mood he had not risked he did not expect he had not been disappointed he was satisfied what satisfied him? To have gained no positive loss, to have brought a positive gain to others, light to the Gentiles. How did Bloom prepare a collation for a Gentile? He poured into two teacups two level spoonfuls, four and all, of Epps soluble cocoa, and proceeded, according to the directions for use printed on the label, to each adding, after sufficient time for infusion, the prescribed ingredients for diffusion, in the manner and in the quantity prescribed. What supererogatory remarks of special hospitality did the host show his guest? Relinquishing his symposiarchal right to the mustache cup of imitation crown derby presented to him by his only daughter, Millicent Millie, he substituted a cup identical with that of his guest and served extraordinarily to his guest and, in reduced measure to himself, the viscous cream ordinarily reserved for the breakfast of his wife, Marion, Molly. Was the guest conscious of and did he acknowledge these marks of hospitality? His attention was directed to them by his host, Jocosely, and he accepted them seriously as they drank in jocose serious silence, Epps mass-produced, the creature Coco. Were there marks of hospitality which he contemplated but suppressed, reserving them for another and for himself on future occasions to complete the act begun? The reparation of a fissure of the length of one and a half inches in the right side of his guest's pocket, a gift to his guest of one of the four ladies' handkerchiefs, if and when ascertained to be in a presentable condition. Who drank more quickly? Bloom, having the advantage of ten seconds at the initiation and taking from the concave surface of a spoon, along the handle of which a steady flow of heat was conducted, three sips to his opponent's one, six to two, nine to three. What celebration accompanied his frequentative act? Concluding by inspection, but erroneously, that his silent companion was engaged in mental composition, he reflected on the pleasures derived from literature of instruction, rather than of amusement, as he himself had applied to the works of William Shakespeare more than once for the solution of difficult problems in imaginary or real life. Had he found their solution? In spite of careful and repeated reading of certain classical passages, aided by a glossary, he had derived imperfect convictions from the text, the answers not bearing in all points. What lines concluded his first piece of original verse written by him, potential poet, at the age of eleven in 1877, on the occasion of the offering of three prizes of ten shillings, five shillings and two shillings sixpence respectively for competition by the shamrock a weekly newspaper an ambition to squint at my verses in print makes me hope that for these you'll find room if you so condescend then please place at the end the name of yours truly l bloom did he find four separating forces between his temporary guest and him? Name, age, race, creed. What anagrams had he made on his name in youth? Leopold Bloom. Elpod Bommel. 
Boldoplope Bolopedum Old Olibo, M.P. What acrostic upon the abbreviation of his first name had he, kinetic poet, sent to Miss Marion Molly Tweedy on the 14th February, 1888? Poets oft have sung in rhyme, of music sweet their praise divine. Let them hymn it nine times nine. Dearer far than song or wine, you are mine, the world is mine. What had prevented him from completing a topical song, music by R. G. Johnson, on the events of the past or fixtures for the actual years, entitled, If Brian Boru Could But Come Back and See Old Dublin Now, commissioned by Michael Gunn, Lisi of the Gaiety Theatre, 46, 47, 48, 49 South King Street, and to be introduced into the sixth scene, The Valley of Diamonds, of the second edition, 30 January 1893, of the grand annual Christmas pantomime, Sinbad the Sailor, produced by R. Shelton, 26 December 1892, Written by Greenleaf Whittier, scenery by George A. Jackson and Cecil Hicks, costumes by Mrs. and Miss Whelan under the personal supervision of Mrs. Michael Gunn, ballots by Nessie Noir, harlequinade by Thomas Otto, and sung by Nellie Bovervist, Principal Girl. Firstly, oscillation between events of imperial and local interest. The anticipated Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria, born 1820, assented 1837, and the posticipated opening of the new municipal fish market. Secondly, apprehension of opposition from extreme circles on the question of the respective visits of their royal highnesses, the Duke and Duchess of York, real, and of His Majesty King Brian Boru, imaginary. Thirdly, a conflict between professional etiquette and professional emulation concerning the recent erections of the Grand Lyric Hall on Burg Quay and the Royal Theatre in Hawkins Street. Fourthly, distraction resultant from compassion for Nellie Bovervist's non-intellectual, non-political, non-topical expression of countenance and concupiscence caused by Nellie Bovervist's revelations of white articles of non-intellectual, non-political, non-topical underclothing, while she, Nellie Bovervist, was in the articles. Fifthly, the difficulties of the selection of appropriate music and humorous allusions from Everybody's Book of Jokes, 1,000 pages and a laugh on every one. Sixthly, the rhymes, homophonous and cacophonous, associated with the names of the new Lord Mayor, Daniel Tallon, the new High Sheriff, Thomas Pyle, and the new Solicitor General, Dunbar Pluckett Barton. What relation existed between their ages? Sixteen years before, in 1888, when Bloom was of Stephen's present age, Stephen was six. Sixteen years after, in 1820, when Stephen would be of Bloom's present age, Bloom would be 54. In 1936, when Bloom would be 70, Stephen 54. Their ages, initially in the ratio of 16 to 0, would be as 17 and a half to 13 and a half. The proportion increasingly and the disparity diminishing according as arbitrary future years were added. For if the proportion existed in 1883 and continued immutable, conceiving that to be possible, till then 1904, when Stephen was 22, Bloom would be 374, and in 1920, when Stephen would be 38, as Bloom then was, Bloom would be 646, while in 1952, when Stephen would have attained the maximum post-alluvial age of 70, 
Bloom being 1190 years alive, having been born in the year 714, would have surpassed by 221 years the maximum antediluvial age, that of Methuselah, 969 years, while if Stephen would continue to live until he would attain that age in the year 3072 AD, Bloom would have been obliged to have been alive 83,300 years, having been obliged to have been born in the year 81,396 B.C. What events might nullify these calculations? The secession of existence of both or either, the inauguration of a new era or calendar, the annihilation of the world and consequent extermination of the human species, inevitable but unpredictable. How many previous encounters prove their pre-existing acquaintance? Two, the first in the lilac garden of Matthew Dillon's house, Medina Villa, Kimmage Road, Roundtown, in 1887, in the company of Stephen's mother, Stephen being then of the age five and reluctant to give his hand in salutation, the second in the coffee room of Breslin's Hotel on a rainy Sunday in the January of 1892, in the company of Stephen's father and Stephen's granduncle, Stephen being then five years older. Did Bloom accept the invitation to dinner given then by the son and afterwards seconded by the father? Very gratefully, with grateful appreciation, with sincere appreciative gratitude, in appreciatively grateful sincerity of regret, he declined. Did their conversation on the subject of these reminiscences reveal a third connecting link between them? Mrs. Reardon, Dante, a widow of independent means, had resided in the house of Stephen's parents from 1st September 1888 to 29 December 1891, and had also resided during the years 1892, 1893, and 1894 in the City Arms Hotel, owned by Elizabeth O'Dowd of 54 Prussian Street, where, during parts of the year 1893 and 1894, she had been a constant informant of Bloom, who resided also in the same hotel, being at that time a clerk in the employment of Joseph Cuffey of Five Smithfield for the superintendence of sales in the adjacent Dublin cattle market on the North Circular Road. Had he performed any special corporal work of mercy for her? He had sometimes propelled her on warm summer evenings, an infirm widow of independent if limited means, in her convalescent bath chair with slow revolutions of its wheels as far as the corner of the North Circular Road, opposite Mr. Gavin Lowe's place of business, where she had remained for a certain time scanning through his one-lensed binocular field glasses unrecognizable citizens on tramcars, roadster bicycles equipped with inflatable pneumatic tires, hackney carriages, tandems, private and hired landaus, dog carts, pony traps, and brakes passing from the city to the Phoenix Park, and vice versa. Why could he then support that his vigil with the greater equanimity because in middle youth he had often sat observing through a roundel of bossed glass of a multicolored pane the spectacle offered with continual changes of the thoroughfare without pedestrians quadrupeds velocipedes vehicles passing slowly quickly evenly round and round and round the rim of a round and round precipitous globe what distinct different memories had each of her, now eight years deceased? The older, her bezique cards and counters, her sky terrier, her suppositious wealth, her lapses of responsiveness and incipient guitar deafness. The younger, her lamp of colza oil before the statue of the Immaculate Conception, her green and maroon brushes for Charles Stuart Parnell and for David Davitt, her tissue papers. 
Were there no means still remaining to him to achieve the rejuvenation which these reminiscences divulged to a younger companion rendered the more desirable? The indoor exercises, formerly intermittently practiced, subsequently abandoned, prescribed in Edward Sanchow's physical strength and how to obtain it, which, designed particularly for commercial men engaged in sedimentary occupations, were to be made with mental concentration in front of a mirror so as to bring into play the various families of muscles and produce successfully a pleasant rigidity, a more pleasant relaxation, and the most pleasant repristination of juvenile agility. Had any special agility been his in earlier youth? Though ring-weight lifting had been beyond his strength, and the full-circle gyration beyond his courage, yet, as a high school scholar, he had excelled in his stable and protracted execution of the half-lever movement on the parallel bars in consequence of his abnormally developed abdominal muscles. Did either openly allude to their racial difference? Neither. What reduced to their simplest reciprocal form were Bloom's thoughts about Stephen's thoughts about Bloom, and about Stephen's thoughts about Bloom's thoughts about Stephen. He thought that he thought that he was a Jew, whereas he knew that he knew that he knew that he was not. What, the enclosure of reticence removed, were their respective parentages? Bloom, only born male, transubstantial heir of Rudolf Verag, subsequently Rudolf Bloom, of Zambadli, Vienna, Budapest, Milan, London, and Dublin, of Ellen Higgins, second daughter of Julius Higgins, born Caroli, and Fanny Higgins, born Hegarty, Stephen, eldest surviving male, consubstantial heir of Simon Dedalus of Cork and Dublin, and of Mary, daughter of Richard and Christina Goulding, born Greer. Had Bloom and Stephen been baptized, and where, and by whom, cleric or layman? Bloom, three times, by the Reverend Mr. Gilmer Johnson, M.A., alone in the Protestant Church of St. Nicholas without, whom, by James O'Connor, Philip Gilligan, and James Fitzpatrick, together, under a pump in the village of Swords, and by the Reverend Charles Malone, C.C., in the Church of the Three Patrons, Rathgar. Stephen, once, by the Reverend Charles Malone, C.C., alone, in the Church of the Three Patrons, Rathgar. Did they find their educational careers similar? Substituting Stephen for Bloom Stoom would have passed successively through a dam school and the high school. Substituting Bloom for Stephen Bleefen would have passed successively through the preparatory junior middle and senior grades of the intermediate and through the matriculation, fine arts and second arts and arts degree courses of the Royal University. Why did Bloom refrain from stating that he had frequented the University of Life? Because of his fluctuating incertitude as to whether this observation had or had not already been made by him to Stephen or by Stephen to him. End of chapter 17, section A. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alan Davis Drake at PaintedRiceCakes.org Ulysses by James Joyce Chapter 17, Section B what two temperaments did they individually represent? The scientific, the artistic. What proofs did Bloom adduce to prove that his tendency was towards applied rather than towards pure science? 
certain possible inventions of which he had cogitated when reclining in a state of supine repletion to aid digestion stimulated by his appreciation of the importance of inventions now common but once revolutionary for example the aeronautic parachute the reflecting telescope the spiral corkscrew the safety pin the mineral water siphon the canal lock with winch and sluice the suction pump were these inventions principally intended for an improved scheme of kindergarten yes rendering obsolete popguns elastic air bladders games of hazard catapults they comprised astronomical kaleidoscopes exhibiting the twelve constellations of the zodiac from aries to pisces miniature mechanical orreries arithmetical gelatin lozenges geometrical to correspond with zoological biscuits globe map playing balls historically costumed dolls what also stimulated his cogitations the financial success achieved by ephraim marx and charles a james the former by his one-pence bazaar at forty-two george's street south the latter his six shillings halfpence shop and world's fancy fair and waxwork exhibition at thirty henry street admission twopence children onepence and the infinite possibilities hitherto unexploited of the modern art of advertisement if condensed in triliteral monoidal symbols vertically and maximum visibility divided horizontally of maximum legibility deciphered and of magnetizing efficacy to arrest involuntary attention to interest to convince to decide such as k2 Kino's Eleven Shillings Trousers, House of Keys, Alexander J. Keys. Such as not. Look at this long candle. Calculate when it burns out, and you receive gratis one pair of our special non-compo boots, guaranteed one candle power. Address, Barclay & Cook, 18 Talbert Street. Basilical Insect Powder, Verbibest Boot Blacking, you want it combined pocket two blade pen knife with corkscrew nail file and pipe cleaner such as never what is home without plum trees potted meat incomplete with it an abode of bliss manufactured by george plumtree twenty three merchants quay dublin put up in four ounce pots and inserted by councillor joseph p nanetti m p rotunda ward eighteen hardwick street under the obituary notices and anniversaries of deceases the name on the label is plumtree a plumtree in a meat pot registered trademark beware of imitations peatmot trumble plea mountpat plam true what example did he adduce to induce stephen to deduce that originality though producing its own reward does not invariably conduce to success his own ideated and rejected project of an illuminated show cart drawn by a beast of burden in which two smartly dressed girls were to be seated engaged in writing what suggested scene was then constructed by stephen solitary hotel in mountain pass autumn twilight firelight in dark corner young man seated young woman enters restless solitary she sits she goes to window she stands she sits twilight she thinks on solitary hotel paper she writes she thinks she writes she sighs wheels and hoofs she hurries out he comes from his dark corner he seizes solitary paper he holds it towards fire twilight he reads solitary what in sloping upright and backhands queen's hotel queen's hotel queen's hotel queen's ho what suggested scene was then reconstructed by bloom the queen's hotel ennis county clare where rudolph bloom rudolph verag died on the evening of twenty seven june eighteen eighty six at some hour unstated in consequence of an overdose of monkshood aconite 
self-administered in the form of a neuralgic liniment composed of two parts of aconite liniment to one of chloroform liniment, purchased by him at 10.20 a.m. in the morning of 27 June 1886 at the Medical Hall of Francis Dennehy, 17 Church Street, Innes. After having, though not in consequence of having, purchased at 3.15 p.m. on the afternoon of 27 June 1886, a new boater straw hat, extra smart. After having, though not in consequence of having, purchased at the hour and in the place aforesaid, the toxin aforesaid, at the general drapery store of James Cullen, 4 Main Street, Ennis. Did he contribute this homonymity to information or coincidence or intuition? Coincidence. Did he depict the scene verbally for his guest to see? He preferred himself to see another's face and listen to another's words by which potential narration was realized and kinetic temperament relieved. Did he see only a second coincidence in the second scene narrated to him, described by the narrator as a physic sight of Palestine or the parable of the palms? It, with the preceding scenes and with others unnarrated but existent by implication, to which add essays or various subjects or moral apothegms, e.g., my favorite hero or procrastination is the thief of time, composed during school years, seemed to him to contain in itself and in conjunction with the personal equations certain possibilities of financial, social, personal, and sexual success, whether specially collected and selected as model pedagogic themes of cent per cent merit, for the use of preparatory and junior grade students, or contributed in printed form, following the precedent of Philip Beaufoy, or Dr. Dick, or Heblon's Studies in Blue, to a publication of certified circulation and solvency, or employed verbally as intellectual stimulations for sympathetic auditors tacitly appreciative of successful narrative and confidently augurated of successful achievement during the increasingly longer nights gradually following the summer solstice on the day but three following Vedilicit, Tuesday, 21st June, S. Aloysius Gonzaga, sunrise 3.33 a.m., sunset 8.29 p.m., which domestic problem as much as if not more than any other, frequently engaged his mind. What to do with our wives? What had been his hypothetical singular solutions? Parlor games, dominoes, halma, tiddlywinks, spillikins, cup and ball, nap, spoil five, bezique, twenty-five, beggar my neighbor, drafts, chess, or backgammon. Embroidery, darning, or knitting for the police-aided clothing society. Musical duets. Mandolin and guitar, piano and flute, guitar and piano. Legal scrivery or envelope addressing. Bi-weekly visits to variety entertainments. Commercial activity as pleasantly commanding and pleasantly obeyed mistress proprietress in a cool dairy shop or warm cigar divan the clandestine satisfaction of erotic irritation in masculine brothels, state-inspected and medically controlled, social visits at regular infrequent prevented intervals and with regular frequent preventative superintendence, to and from female acquaintances of recognized respectability in the vicinity, courses of evening instruction specially designed to render liberal instruction agreeable. What instances of deficient mental development in his wife inclined him in favor of the last-mentioned ninth solution? In disoccupied moments she had more than once covered a sheet of paper with signs and hieroglyphics which he stated were Greek and Irish and Hebrew characters. She had interrogated constantly at varying intervals as to the correct method of writing the capital initial of the name of the city in Canada. Quebec. 
she understood little of political complications internal or balance of power external in calculating the addenda of bills she frequently had recourse to digital aid after completion of laconic epistolary compositions she abandoned the implement of calligraphy in the encaustic pigment exposed to the corrosive action of copperas green vitriol and night gall unusual polysyllables of foreign origin she interpreted phonetically or by false analogy or by both metempsychosis met him pike hoses alias mendacious person mentioned in sacred scripture what compensated in the false balance of her intelligence for these and such deficiencies of judgment regarding persons places and things the false apparent parallelism of all perpendicular arms of all balances proved true by construction the counterbalance of her proficiency of judgment regarding one person proved true by experiment how had he attempted to remedy this state of comparative ignorance variously by leaving in a conspicuous place a certain book opened at a certain page by assuming in her when alluding explanatorily latent knowledge by open ridicule in her presence of some absent others ignorant lapse with what success had he attempted direct instruction she followed not at all a part of the whole gave attention with interest comprehended with surprise with care repeated with greater difficulty remembered forgot with ease with misgiving re-remembered repeated with error what system had proved more effective indirect suggestion implicating self-interest example she disliked umbrella with rain he liked women with umbrella she disliked new hat with rain he liked women with new hat he brought new hat with rain she carried umbrella with new hat accepting the analogy implied in his guest's parable which examples of post exilic eminence did he adduce three seekers of the pure truth moses of egypt moses maimonides author of more nebuchum guide of the perplexed and moses mendelssohn of such eminence that from moses of egypt to moses mendelssohn there arose none like moses maimonides what statement was made under correction by bloom concerning a fourth seeker of pure truth by name aristotle mentioned with permission by stephen that the seeker mentioned had been a pupil of a rabbinical philosopher name uncertain were other and apocryphal illustrious sons of the law and children of a selected or rejected race mentioned felix bartholdi mendelssohn composer baruch spinoza philosopher mendoza pugilist ferdinand lasalle reformer dualist what fragments of verse from the ancient hebrew and ancient irish languages were cited with modulations of voice and translation of texts by guest to host and by host to guest by stephen sul sul sularun sul go shukhar agas su go kun walk 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 your way walk in safety walk with care by bloom kiflach harman racht nicht bad lachtemit thy temple amid thy hair is as a slice of pomegranate how was a glyphic comparison of the phonic symbols of both languages made in substantiation of the oral comparison by juxtaposition on the penultimate blank page of a book of inferior literary style entitled sweets of sin produced by bloom and so manipulated that its front cover came in contact with the surface of the table with a pencil supplied by stephen stephen wrote the irish characters for g a d m 
simple and modified, and Bloom in turn wrote the Hebrew characters Gimel, Aleph, Daleth, and, in the absence of Mem, a substitute Quaff, explaining their arithmetical values as ordinal and cardinal numbers, vidilicit three, one, four, and one hundred. Was a knowledge possessed by both of each of these languages, the extinct and the revived, theoretical or practical? Theoretical, being confined to certain grammatical rules of accidents and syntax and practically excluding vocabulary. What points of contact existing between these languages and between the peoples who spoke them? The presence of guttural sounds, diacritic aspirations, epithetic and servile letters in both languages, their antiquity, both having been taught on the plain of Shinar 242 years after the deluge in the seminary instituted by Phineas Farsay, descendant of Noah, progenitor of Israel, and descendant of Herber and Harriman, progenitors of Ireland, their archaeological, geological, hagiographical, exegetical, homiletic, toponomastic, historical and religious literatures comprising the works of rabbis and kaldis, Torah, Talmud, Misnach and Gemara, Masor, Pentutech, Book of the Dung Cow, Book of Alimut, Garland of Houth, Book of Kells, their dispersal, persecution, survival and revival the isolation of their synagogal and ecclesiastical rites in Ghetto, St. Mary's Abbey, and Mass House, Adam and Eve's Tavern, the proscription of their national costumes in penal laws and Jewish dress acts, the restoration in Chana David of Zion, and the possibility of Irish political autonomy or devolution. What anthem did Bloom chant partially in anticipation of that multiple, ethnically irreducible consummation? Kolod Balijwa Nima Nefish Yehuda Chomija Why was the chant arrested in the conclusion of his first distich? In consequence of defective mnemotechnic. How did the chanter compensate for this deficiency? By a paraphrasic version of the general text. In what common study did their mutual reflections merge? The increasing simplification traceable from the Egyptian epigraphic hieroglyphics to the Greek and Roman alphabets and the anticipation of modern stenography and telegraphic code in the cuneiformic inscriptions, Semitic, and the virgular quincecostgate ogham writing, Celtic. Did the guest comply with his host's request? Doubly, by appending his signature in Irish and Roman characters. What was Stephen's auditive sensation? He heard in a profound ancient male unfamiliar melody the accumulation of the past. What was Bloom's visual sensation? He saw in a quick young male familiar form the predestination of a future. What were Stevens and Bloom's quasi-simultaneous volitional quasi-sensations of concealed identities? Visually, Stevens visually Stevens, the traditional figure of hypostasis depicted by Johannes Damasinus, Lentulus Romanus, and Epiphanus Monacus, as leucodermic, sesquipedalian with wine-dark hair. Auditively, Blooms, the traditional accent of the ecstasy of catastrophe. What future careers had been possible for Bloom in the past and with what exemplars? In the church, Roman, Anglican, or nonconformist, exemplars, the very Reverend John Comey, S.J., the Reverend T. Salmon, D.D., Provost of Trinity College, Dr. Alexander J. Dowie. At the bar, English or Irish, exemplars Seymour Bush, 
KC, Rufus Isaacs, KC, on the stage modern or Shakespearean, exemplars Charles Wyndham, high comedian Osmond Turrell, died 1901, exponent of Shakespeare. Did the host encourage his guests to chant in a modulated voice a strange legend in an applause? Did the host encourage his guests to chant in a modulated voice a strange legend on an allied theme? Reassuringly, their place, where none could hear them talk, being secluded, reassured the decocted beverages, allowing for subsolid residual sediment of a mechanical mixture, water plus sugar plus cream plus cocoa, having been consumed. Recite the first major part of this chanted legend. Little Harry Hughes and his schoolfellows all went out for to play ball. And the very first ball little Harry Hughes played, he drove it o'er the Jews' garden wall. And the very second ball little Harry Hughes played, he broke the Jews' windows all. How did the son of Rudolph receive this first part? With mixed feeling, smiling, a Jew he heard with pleasure, and a Jew he heard with pleasure, and saw the unbroken kitchen window. Recite the second part, minor, of the legend. Then out there came the Jew's daughter, and she all dressed in green. Come back, come back, you pretty little boy, and play your ball again. I can't come back, and I won't come back, without my schoolfellows all. For if my master he did hear, he'd make it a sorry ball. She took him by the lily-white hand, and led him along the hall, until she led him to a room where none could hear him call. She took a penknife out her pocket and cut off his little head. And now he'll play his ball no more, for he lies among the dead. How did the father of Millicent receive this second part? With mixed feelings. Unsmiling, he heard and saw with wonder a Jew's daughter all dressed in green. Condense Stephen's Commentary one of all, and least of all, is the victim predestined. Once by inadvertence, once by design, he challenges his destiny. It comes when he is abandoned and challenges him reluctant and, as an apparition of hope and youth, holds him unrestraining. It leads him to a strange habitation, to a secret infidel apartment, and there implacable emulates him consenting. Why was the host, victim predestined, sad? He wished that a tale of a deed should be told of a deed not by him, should by him not be told. Why was the host, reluctant, unresisting, still? In accordance with the law of the conservation of energy. Why was the host, secret infidel, silent? He weighed the possible evidences for and against ritual murder, the inclinations of the hierarchy, the superstition of the populace, the propagation of rumor in continued fraction of verdicity, the envy of opulence, the influence of retaliation, the sporadic reappearance of avatistic delinquency, the mitigating circumstances of fanaticism, hypnotic suggestion, and sonambulism from which, if any, of these mental or physical disorders was he not totally immune. From hypnotic suggestion, once walking he had not recognized his sleeping apartment, more than once walking he had been for an indefinite time incapable of moving or uttering sounds. From sonambulism, once sleeping his body had risen, crouched and crawled in the direction of a heatless fire, and, having attained its destination, there curled, unheeded, in night attire had lain, sleeping. 
had this latter or any cognate phenomenon declared itself in any member of his family twice in hull street and in ontario terrace his daughter millicent milly at the age of six and eight years uh, his daughter millicent milly at the ages of six and eight years had uttered in sleep an exclamation of terror and had replied to the interrogations of two figures in night attire with a vacant mute expression what other infantile memories had he of her fifteen june eighteen eighty nine a querulous newborn female infant crying to cause and lessen congestion a child named patty socks she took with her shocks her money box counted his three free money penny buttons one flew flee a doll a boy a sailor she cast away blonde born of too dark she had blonde ancestry remote a violation er hauptmann heinau austrian army proximate a hallucination lieutenant mulvey british navy what endemic characteristics were present conversely the nasal and frontal formation was derived in a direct line of lineage which though interrupted would continue at distant intervals to more distant intervals to its most distant intervals what memories had he of her adolescence she relegated her hoop and skipping rope to a recess on the duke's lawn entreated by a english visitor she declined to permit him to make and take away her photographic image objection not stated on the south circular road in the company of elsa potter followed by an individual of sinister aspect she went halfway down stammer street and turned abruptly back reason of change not stated on the vigil of the fifteenth anniversary of her birth she wrote a letter from mullingar county westmeath making a brief allusion to a local student faculty and year not stated did this first division portending a second division afflict him less than he had imagined more than he had hoped what second departure was contemporaneously perceived by him similarly if differently a temporary departure of his cat why similar why differently similarly because actuated by a secret purpose the quest of a new male mullingar student or of a healing herb valerian differently because of different possible returns to the inhabitants or to the habituation in other respects were their differences similar in passivity in economy in the instinct of tradition in unexpectedness as inasmuch as leaning she sustained her blonde hair for him to ribbon it for her c f neck arching cat moreover on the free surface of the lake in stephen's green amid inadverted reflections of trees her uncommented spit describing concentric circles of waterings indicated by the constancy of its permanence the locus of a sonambulant prostrate fish c f mouse watching cat again in order to remember the date combatants issue and consequences of a famous military engagement she pulled a plate of her hair c f ear washing cat Furthermore, silly Milly, she dreamed of having had an unspoken, unremembered conversation with a horse, whose name had been Joseph, to whom, which, she had offered a tumbler full of lemonade, which it, he, had appeared to have accepted, C.F., hearth-dreaming cat, hence, in passivity, in economy, in the instinct of tradition, in unexpectedness, their differences were similar. In what way had he utilized gifts one an owl to a clock given as matrimonial auguries to interest and to instruct her as object lessons to explain one the nature and habit of oviparous animals the possibility of aerial flight certain abnormalities of vision the secular process of embalsamation two 
the principle of the pendulum exemplified in bob wheel gear and regulator the translation in terms of human or social regulation of the various positions of clockwise movable indicators on a unmoving dial the exactitude of the recurrence per hour of an instant in each hour when the longer and the shorter indicators were at the same angle of inclination vidilicit five five slash eleven minutes past each hour per hour in arithmetical progression in what manners did she reciprocate she remembered on the twenty-seventh anniversary of his birth she presented to him a breakfast mustache cup of imitation crown derby porcelain ware she provided at quarter day of thereabouts if or when purchases had been made by him not for her she showed herself attentive to his necessities anticipating his desires she admired a natural phenomenon having been explained by him to her she expressed the immediate desire to possess without gradual acquisition a fraction of his science the moiety the quarter a thousandth part what proposal did bloom diambulist father of milly sonambulist make to stephen noctambulist to pass and repose the hours intervening between Thursday, proper, and Friday, normal, on an extemporized cubicle in the apartment immediately above the kitchen, and immediately adjacent to the sleeping apartment of his host and hostess. What various advantages would or might have resulted from a prolongation of such an extemporization? For the guest security of domicile and seclusion of study for the host rejuvenation of intelligence vicarious satisfaction for the hostess disintegration of obsession acquisition of correct italian pronunciation why might these several provisional contingencies between a guest and a hostess not necessarily preclude or be precluded by a permanent eventuality of reconciliatory union between a schoolfellow and a jew's daughter because the way to a daughter led through a mother the way to a mother through a daughter to what inconsistent polysyllabic question of his host did the guest return a monosyllabic negative answer if he had known the late mrs emily sinico accidentally killed at sydney parade railway station fourteen october nineteen o three what inchoate corollary statement was consequently suppressed by the host a statement explanatory of his absence on the occasion of the internment of mrs mary dedalus born goulding twenty six june nineteen o three vigil of the anniversary of the decease of rudolph bloom born virag was the proposal of asylum accepted promptly inexplicably with amicability gratefully it was declined what exchange of money took place between host and guest the former returned to the latter without interest the sum of one pound seven shillings one pound seven shillings sterling advanced by the latter to the former what counter-proposals were alternately advanced accepted modified declined restated in other terms re-accepted ratified reconfirmed to inaugurate a prearranged course of italian instruction place the residence of the instructed to inaugurate a course of vocal instruction place the residence of the instructress to inaugurate a series of static semi-static and peripathetic intellectual dialogues places the residence of both speakers if both speakers were resident in the same place the ship hotel and tavern six lower abbey street w and e connery proprietors the national library of ireland ten kildare street the national maternity hospital twenty nine thirty and thirty one holler street a public garden the vicinity of a place of worship a conjunction of two or more public thoroughfares the point of bisection of a right line drawn between these two residences if both speakers were resident in different places 
what rendered problematic for Bloom the realization of these mutually self-excluding propositions. The irreparability of the past, once at a performance of Albert Hengler's Circus in the Rotunda, Rutland Square, Dublin, an intuitive party-colored clown in quest of paternity had penetrated from the ring to a place in the auditorium where Bloom, solitary, was seated and had publicly declared to an exhilarated audience that he, Bloom, was his, the clown's, papa. The improvidability of the future, once in the summer of 1898, he, Bloom, had marked a florin with three notches on the milled edge, and tendered it in payment of an account due to and received by J. and T. Davy, family grocers, one Charlesmont Hall, Grand Canal, for circulation on the waters of civil finance, for possible circuitous or direct return. Was the clown Bloom's son? No. Had Bloom's coin returned? Never. Why would a recurrent frustration the more depress him? Because at the critical turning point of human existence he desired to amend many social conditions, the product of inequality and avarice and international animosity. He believed that human life was infinitely perfectible, eliminating these conditions. There remained the generic conditions imposed by nature, as distinct from human law, as integral parts of the human whole, the necessity of destruction to procure alimentary sustenance, the painful character of the ultimate functions of separate existence, the agonies of birth and death, the monotonous menstruation of simian and particularly human females extending from the age of puberty to the menopause, inevitable accidents at sea, in mines and factories, certain very painful maladies and their resultant surgical operations, innate lunacy and congenital criminality, decimating epidemics, catastrophic cataclysms which make terror the basis of human mentality seismic upheavals, the epicenters of which are located in densely populated regions, the fact of vital growth through convulsions and metamorphoses from infancy through maturity to decay. Why did he desist from speculation? Because it was a task for a superior intelligence to substitute other more acceptable phenomenon in the place of the less acceptable phenomenon to be removed. Did Stephen participate in his dejection? He affirmed his significance as a conscious rational animal, proceeding syllogistically from the known to the unknown, and a conscious rational reagent between a micro and macrocosm ineluctably constructed upon the uncertainty of the void. Was this affirmation apprehended by Bloom? Not verbally, substantially. What comforted his misapprehension? that as a complete keyless citizen he had proceeded energetically from the unknown to the known through the incertitude of the void. In what order of precedence, with what attendant ceremony, was the exodus from the house of bondage to the wilderness of inhabitation effected? Lighted candle in stick borne by Bloom. Diaconal hat on ash plant borne by Stephen. With what intonation secreto of what commemorative psalm? The 113th, Modus Peregrinus. In exitu Israel de Egypto, Domus Jacob de Populo Barbaro. What did each do at the door of egress? Bloom set the candlestick on the floor, Stephen put the hat on his head. For what creature was the door of egress a door of ingress? For a cat. What spectacle confronted them when they, first the host, then the guest, emerged silently, double dark, from obscurity by a passage from the rear of the house into the penumbra of the garden? The heaven tree of stars hung with humid night-blue fruit. 
with what meditations did bloom accompany his demonstration to his companion of various constellations meditations of evolution increasingly vaster of the moon invisible in incipient lunation approaching perigree of the infinite latiginous scintillating uncondensed milky way discernible by daylight by an observer placed at the lower end of a cylindrical vertical shaft five hundred feet deep sunk from the surface towards the centre of the earth of cirrus alpha in canis major ten light-years fifty-seven billion miles distant and in a volume nine hundred times the dimension of our planet of Arcturus, of the procession of equinoxes, of Orion with belt and sextuple theta and nebula in which one hundred of our solar systems could be contained, of moribund and of nascent new stars such as Nova in 1901, of our system plunging towards the constellation of Hercules, of the parallax or parallactic drift of so-called fixed stars, in reality ever moving wanderers from immeasurable remote eons to infinitely remote futures in comparison with which the years threescore and ten of allotted human life formed a parenthesis of infinitesimal brevity were there obverse meditations of involution increasingly less vast of the eons of geological periods recorded in the stratifications of the earth of the myriad minute etymological organic existences concealed in cavities of the earth beneath removable stones in hives and mounds of microbes germs bacteria bacilli spermatozoa of the incalculable trillions of billions of millions of imperceptible molecules contained by cohesion of molecular affinity in a single pinhead of the universe of human serum constellated with red and white bodies themselves universes of void space constellated with other bodies each in continuity its universe of divisible component bodies of which each was again divisible in divisions of redivisible component bodies divided and divisors ever diminishing without actual division till if the progress were carried far enough nought nowhere was ever reached why did he not elaborate these calculations to a more precise result because some years previously in eighteen eighty six when occupied with the problem of the quadrature of the circle he had learned of the existence of a number computed to a relative degree of accuracy to be of such magnitude and of so many places e g the ninth power of the ninth power of nine that the result had been obtained thirty-three closely printed volumes of one thousand pages each of innumerable queries and reams of indian paper would have to be requisitioned in order to contain the complete tale of its printed integers of units tens hundreds thousands ten thousands hundreds of thousands millions tens of millions hundreds of millions billions the nucleus of the nebula of every digit of every series containing succinctly the potentiality of being raised to the utmost kinetic elaboration of any power of any of its powers did he find the problems of the inhabitability of the planets and their satellites by a race given in species and of the possible social and moral redemption of such race by a redeemer easy of solution of a different order of difficulty did he find the problems of the inhabitability of the planets and their satellites by a race given in species and of the possible social and moral redemption of such race by a redeemer easy of solution of a different order of difficulty did he find the problems of the inhabitability of the planets and their satellites by a race given in species and of the possible social and moral redemption of such race by a redeemer easy of solution of a different order of difficulty did he find the problems of the inhabitability of the planets and their satellites by a race given in species and of the possible social and moral redemption of such race by a redeemer easy of solution 
of a different order of difficulty. Did he find the problems of the inhabitability of the planets and their satellites by a race, given in species, and of the possible social and moral redemption of such race by a redeemer, easy of solution? Of a different order of difficulty. Did he find the problems of the inhabitability of the planets and their satellites by a race, given in species, and of the possible social and moral redemption of such race by a redeemer, easy of solution? Of a different order of difficulty. Conscious that the human organism normally capable of sustaining an atmospheric pressure of 19 tons, when elevated to a considerable altitude in the terrestrial atmosphere, suffered with arithmetical progression of intensity, according as the line of demarcation between troposphere and stratosphere was approximated from nasal hemorrhage, impeded respiration and vertigo when proposing this problem for a solution, he had conjectured as a working hypothesis which could not be proved impossible that a more adaptable and differently anatomically constructed race of beings might subsist otherwise under Martian, Mercurial, Venereal, Jovian, Saturnian, Neptunian, or Uranian sufficient and equivalent conditions though an apogean humanity of beings created in various forms with finite differences resulting similar to the whole and to one another would probably there as here remain inalterably and inalienably attached to vanities to vanities of vanities and to all that is vanity and the problem of possible redemption the minor was proved by the major. Which various features of the constellations were in turn considered? The various colors significant of varying degrees of vitality, white, yellow, crimson, vermilion, cinnabar. Their degrees of brilliancy, their magnitudes revealed up to and including the seventh. Their positions, the Wagoner's Star, Walsingham Way, the Chariot of David, the annular cinchers of Saturn, the condensation of the spiral nebula into the sun, the interdependent gyrations of double suns, the independent synchronous discoveries of Galileo, Simon Marius, Piazzi, Levieri, Herschel, Galley, the systematizations attempted by Bode and Kepler of cubes of distances and squares of time of revolution, the almost infinite comprehensibility of hirsute comets and their vast elliptical egressive and re-entrant orbits from perihelion to aphelion the sidereal origin of meteoric stones the libyan floods on mars about the period of the birth of the younger astroscopist the annual reoccurrence of meteoric showers about the period of the feast of saint lawrence martyr low august the monthly reoccurrence known as the new moon with the old moon in her arms the posited influence of celestial on human bodies the appearance of a star first magnitude of exceeding brilliancy dominated by night and day a new luminous sun generated by the collision and amalgamation in incandescence of two non-luminous ex-suns about the period of the birth of william shakespeare over delta in the recumbent never-setting constellation of cassiopeia and of a star second magnitude of similar origin but of lesser brilliancy which had appeared in and disappeared from the constellation of the corona septentrionalis about the period of the birth of leopold bloom and of other stars of presumably similar origin which had effectively or presumably appeared in and disappeared from the constellation of andromeda about the period of the birth of stephen dedalus and in and from the constellation of origa some years after the birth and death of rudolf bloom jr and in and from other constellations some years before or after the birth or death of other persons the attendant phenomenon of eclipses, solar and lunar, 
from immersion to immersion abated of wind transit of shadow taciturnity of winged creatures emergent of nocturnal or crepuscular animals persistence of infernal light obscurity of terrestrial waters pallor of human beings his bloom's logical conclusion having weighed the matter and allowing for possible error that it was not a heaven tree not a heaven grot not a heaven beast not a heaven man that it was a utopia there being no known method for the known to the unknown and infinitely renderable equally finite by the suppositious apposition of one or more bodies equally of the same and of different magnitudes a mobility of illusory forms immobilized in space remobilized in air a past which possibly had ceased to exist as a present before its probable spectators had entered actual present existence was he more convinced of the aesthetic value of the spectacle indubitably in consequence of the reiterated examples of poets in the delirium of the frenzy of attachment or in the abasement of rejection invoking ardent sympathetic constellations or the frigidity of the satellite of their planet did he then accept as an article of belief the theory of astrological influences upon sublunary disasters it seemed to him as possible of proof as a confutation and the nomenclature employed in its selenographical chart as attributable to verifiable intuition as to fallacious analogy the lake of dreams the sea of rains the gulf of dews the ocean of fecundity what special affinities appeared to him to exist between the moon and women her antiquity in preceding and surviving successive tellurian generations her nocturnal predominance her satellitic dependence her luminary reflection her constancy under all her phases rising and setting by her appointed times waxing and waning the forced invariability of her aspect her indeterminate response to inaffirmative interrogation her potency over effluent and refluent waters, her power to enamor, to mortify, to invest with beauty, to render insane, to incite to and aid delinquency, the tranquil inscrutability of her visage, the terribility of her isolated, dominant, implacable, resplendent propinquity, her omens of tempest and of calm, the stimulation of her light, her motion and her presence, the admonition of her craters her arid seas her silence her splendor when visible her attraction when invisible what visible luminous sign attracted blooms who attracted stephen's gaze in the second story rear of his bloom's house the light of a paraffin oil lamp with oblique shade projected on a screen of roller blinds supplied by frank o'hara window blind curtain roll and revolving shutter manufactured sixteen on gare street how did he elucidate the mystery of an invisible attractive person his wife marion molly bloom denoted by a visible splendid sign a lamp with indirect or direct verbal allusions or affirmations with subdued affection and admiration with description with impediment with suggestion both then were silent silent each contemplating the other in both mirrors of the reciprocal flesh of there his no his fellow faces were they indefinitely inactive at stephen's suggestion at bloom's instigation both first stephen then bloom in penumbra urinated their sides contagious their organs of micturation reciprocally rendered invisible by manual circumposition their gazes first blooms then stephen's elevated to the projected luminous and semi-luminous shadow similarly 
the trajectories of their first sequent and simultaneous urinations were dissimilar blooms longer less irruent in the incomplete form of the bifurcated penultimate alphabetical letter who in his ultimate year at high school eighteen eighty had been capable of attaining the point of greatest altitude against the whole concurrent strength of the institution two hundred and ten scholars stevens higher more sibilant who in the ultimate hours of the previous day had augmented by diuretic consumption and insistent vesicle pressure what different problems presented themselves to each concerning the invisible collateral organ of the other to bloom the problems of irritability tumescence rigidity reactivity dimensions sanitariness pilosity to stephen the problem of the sacerdotal integrity of jesus circumcised one january holiday of obligation to hear mass and abstain from unnecessary servile work and the problem as to whether the divine prepus the carnal bridal ring of the holy roman catholic apostolic church conserved in calcutta were deserving of simple hypergily or of the fourth degree of latria according to the abscission of such divine excrescences as hair and toenails what celestial sign was by both simultaneously observed a star precipitated with great apparent velocity across the firmament from vega in the lyre above the zenith beyond the star group of the tress of berenice towards the zodiacal sign of leo end of chapter 17 section b This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Alan Davis Drake in Long Branch, New Jersey. Ulysses by James Joyce. Chapter 17, Section C. How did the centripetal remainder afford egress to the centrifugal departer? By inserting the barrel of an originated male key in the hole of an unstable female lock, obtaining a purchase on the bow of the key, and turning its wards from right to left, withdrawing a bolt from its staple, pulling inward spasmodically an obsolescent unhinged door and revealing an aperture for free egress and free ingress. How did they take leave, one of the other, in separation? Standing perpendicular at the same door and on different sides of its base, the lines of their valedictory arms meeting at any point and forming any angle less than the sum of two right angles. What sound accompanied the union of their tangent, the disunion of their respectively centrifugal and centripetal hands, the sound of the peal of the hour of the night by the chime of the bells in the church of St. George? What echoes of that sound were by both and each heard? By Stephen Liliata ruti landlium, turma circumdent, e ubilentium te virginium, chorus excipiat. By Bloom Hey ho, hey ho, hey ho, hey ho. Where were the several members of the company with which Bloom that day, at the bidding of that peel, had travelled from Sandy Mount in the south to Glassenvin in the north? Martin Cunningham in bed, Jack Power in bed, Simon Dedalus in bed, Ned Lambert in bed, Tom Kiernan in bed, Joe Hines in bed. John Henry Menton in bed, Bernard Corrigan 
in bed. Patsy Dingham, in bed. Patty Dingham, in the grave. Alone, what did Bloom hear? The double reverberation of retreating feet in the heaven-born earth. The double vibration of a Jew's harp in the resonant lane. Alone, what did Bloom feel? The cold of intercellular space, thousands of degrees below freezing point, or the absolute zero of Fahrenheit, centigrade, or Réaumur, the incipient intimations of proximate dawn. Of what did bell chime and hand touch and footstep and lone chill remind him? Of companions now in various manners in different places defunct. Percy Apjohn, killed in action, Muddy River. Philip Gilligan, Phthisis, Jervis Street Hospital. Matthew F. Kane, accidental drowning, Dublin Bay. Philip Moisel, Nemia, Hadesbury Street. Michael Hart, Thysis, Mater Misericordia Hospital, Patrick Dingham, Apoplexy, Sandy Mount. What prospect of what phenomenon inclined him to remain? The disparition of three final stars, the diffusion of daybreak, the apparition of a new solar disk. Had he ever been a spectator of those phenomenon? Once, in 1887, after a protracted performance of charades in the house of Luc Doyle, Kimage, he had awaited with patience the apparition of the diurnal phenomenon, seated on a wall, his gaze turned in the direction of Mizrach, the east. He remembered the initial para-phenomenon? More active air, a matitudinal distant cock, ecclesiastical clocks at various points, avine music, the isolated tread of an early wayfarer, the visible diffusion of the light of an invisible luminous body, the first golden limb of the resurgent sun, perceptible low on the horizon. Did he remain? With deep inspiration he returned re-traversing the garden, re-entering the passage. With deep inspiration he returned, re-traversing the garden, re-entering the passage, re-closing the door. With brief suspiration he resumed the candle, reascended the stairs, re-approached the door of the front room, hall floor, and re-entered. What suddenly arrested his ingress? The right temporal lobe of the hollow sphere of his cranium came into contact with a solid timber angle where, an infinitesimal but sensible fraction of a second later, a painful sensation was located in consequence of antecedent sensations transmitted and registered. Describe the alterations affected in the disposition of the articles of furniture. A sofa, upholstered in prune plush, had been translocated from opposite the door to the ingle side near the compacted furled union jack, an alteration which he had frequently intended to execute. The blue and white checkered inlaid majolical topped table had been placed opposite the door in the place vacated by the prune plush sofa. The walnut sideboard, a projecting angle of which had momentarily arrested his ingress, had been moved from its position beside the door to a more advantageous but more perilous position in front of the door. Two chairs had been moved from right and left to the ingle side to the position originally occupied by the blue and white checker inlaid majolica-topped table. Describe them. 1. A squat stuffed easy chair with stout arms extended and back slanted to the rear, which, repelled in recoil, had then upturned an irregular fringe of a rectangular rug, and now displayed on its amply upholstered seat 
a centralized diffusing and diminishing discoloration the other a slender splayfoot chair of glossy cane curves placed directly opposite the former its frame from top to seat and from seat to base being varnished dark brown its seat being a bright circle of white plated rush what significances attached to these two chairs significance of similitude of posture of symbolism of circumstantial evidence of testimonial supermanence what occupied the position originally occupied by the sideboard a vertical piano cadby with exposed keyboard its closed coffins supporting a pair of long yellow ladies gloves and an emerald ashtray containing four consumed matches a partly consumed cigarette and two discolored ends of cigarettes its music rest supporting the music in the key of g natural for voice and piano of love's old sweet song words by g clifton bingham composed by j l malloy sung by madame antoinette sterling open at the last page with the final indications ad libitum forte pedal animato sustained pedal Ritarando, close. With what sensations did Bloom contemplate in rotating these objects? With strain, elevating a candlestick, with pain, feeling on his right temple a contused tumescence, with attention, focusing his gaze on a large, dull, passive, and slender, bright, active, with solicitation, bending and downturning the upturning rug fringe, with amusement, Remembering Dr. Malachy Mulligan's scheme of color containing the graduation of green, with pleasure, repeating the words and antecedent act and perceiving through various channels of internal sensibility the consequent and concomitant tepid pleasant diffusion of gradual discoloration. His next proceeding? From an open box on the majolica-topped table, he extracted a black diminutive cone, one inch in height, placed it on its circular base in a small tin plate, placed his candlestick on the right corner of the mantelpiece, produced from his wainscoat a folded page of prospectus, illustrated, entitled Agendath Natum unfolded the same, examined it superficially, rolled it into a thin cylinder, ignited it in the candle flame, applied it when ignited to the apex of the cone till the latter reached the stage of rudolence, placed the cylinder in the basin of the candlestick, disposing its unconsumed part in such a manner as to facilitate total combustion. What followed this operation? the truncated conical crater summit of the diminutive volcano emitted a vertical and serpentine fume redolent of aromatic oriental incense what homeothetic objects other than the candlestick stood on the mantelpiece a timepiece of striated Canemera marble stopped at the hour of 4.46 a.m. on the 21st March, 1896, matrimonial gift of Matthew Dillon, a dwarf tree of glacial arborescence under a transparent bell-shade, matrimonial gift of Luke and Caroline Doyle, an embalmed owl, matrimonial gift of Alderman John Hooper, what interchanges of looks took place between these three objects and Bloom? In the mirror of the gilt-bordered pier-glass, the undecorated back of the dwarf tree regarded the upright back of the embalmed owl. Before the mirror, the matrimonial gift of Alderman John Hooper, with a clear, melancholy, wise, bright, motionless, compassionate gaze, regarded Bloom while Bloom, with obscure, tranquil, profound, motionless, compassionate gaze, regarded the matrimonial gift of Luke and Caroline Doyle. What composite, asymmetrical image in the mirror then attracted his attention? The image of a solitary ipso-relative 
mutable, aliorelative man. What solitary ipsa relative? Brothers and sisters had he none, yet that man's father was his grandfather's son. Why mutable, aliorelative? From infancy to maturity he had resembled his maternal procreatrix. From maturity to senility he would increasingly resemble his paternal procreator. What final visual impression was communicated to him by the mirror? The optical reflection of several inverted volumes improperly arranged and not in the order of their common letters with scintillating titles on the two bookshelves opposite. Catalog these books. Tom's Dublin Post Office Directory, 1886. Dennis Florence McCarthy's Poetical Works, Copper Beechleaf Bookmark at page 5. Shakespeare's Work. Dark Crimson Morocco, Gold Tooled. The Useful Ready Reckoner, Brown Cloth. The Secret History of the Court of Charles II, Red Cloth, Tooled Binding. The Child's Guide, Blue Cloth. The Beauties of Killarney, Wrappers. When We Were Boys by William O'Brien, M.P. Greenish Cloth, Slightly Faded, Envelope Bookmark at page 217. Thoughts from Spinoza, Maroon Leather, The Story of the Heavens by Sir Robert Ball, Blue Cloth, Alice's Three Trips to Madagascar, Brown Cloth, Title Obliterated, The Stark Monroe Letters by A. Conan Doyle, Property of the City of Dublin Public Library, 106 Capel Street, Lent 21st May, with son Eve, 1904, due for June, 1904, 13 days overdue, black cloth binding bearing a white letter number ticket. Voyages in China by Viator, recovered with brown paper, red ink title. Philosophy of the Talmud, sewn pamphlet, Lockhart's Life of Napoleon, Cover wanting, marginal annotations, minimalizing victories, aggrandizing defeats of the propagandist. Sol und Haben by Gustav Freitag. Blackboards, Gothic characters, cigarette coupon bookmark at page 24. Hosier's History of the Russo-Turkish War. Brown cloth, A volumes, with gummed label. Garrison Library, Governor's Parade, Gibraltar, in verso of cover. Lawrence Bloomfield in Ireland by William Allingham. Second edition, green cloth, gilt, trayfold design. Previous owner's name on recto of flyleaf erased. A handbook of astronomy. Cover, brown leather, detached S-plates. Antique letterpress, long primer, author's footnotes, non paral marginal clues, breviere, captions, small pica. The Hidden Life of Christ, blackboards. In the Track of the Sun, yellow cloth, title page missing, recurrent title intestation. Physical Strength and How to Obtain It, by Eugene Sandow, red cloth. Short but yet plain elements of geometry. Written in French by F. Ignat. Parties and rendered into English by John Harris, D.D. London. Printed for John Naplock at the Bishop's Head, M.D.C.C.X.I. With dedicatory epistle to his worthy friend Charles Cox, Esquire. Member of Parliament for the Burg of Southwark and having ink calligraphed statement in the flyleaf certifying that the book was the property of Michael Gallagher, dated this 10th day of May, 1822, and requesting the person who should find it, if the book should be lost or go astray, to return it to Michael Gallagher, Carpenter, Durfeygate, Anacorfi, County Wicklow, the finest place in the world. 
what reflections occupied his mind during the process of reversion of the inverted volumes the necessity of order a place for everything and everything in its place the deficient appreciation of literature possessed by females the incongruity of an apple incunated in a tumbler and of an umbrella inclined in a clothes tool the insecurity of hiding any secret document behind beneath or between the pages of a book which volume was the largest in bulk hosier's history of the russo-turkish war what among other data did the second volume of the work in question contain? The name of a decisive battle, forgotten, frequently remembered by a decisive officer, Major Brian Cooper Tweedy, remembered. Why, firstly and secondly, did he not consult the work in question? Firstly, in order to exercise pneumotechnic. Secondly, because after an interval of amnesia, when seated at the central table, about to consult the work in question, he remembered by mnemotechnic the name of the military engagement, Plevna. What caused him consolation in this sitting posture? The candor, nudity, pose, tranquility, youth, grace, sex, counsel of a statue erect in the center of the table, an image of Narcissus purchased by auction from P. A. Wren, Nine Bachelor's Walk. What caused him irritation in this sitting posture? Inhibitory pressure of collar, size 17, and waistcoat, five buttons, two articles of clothing superfluous in the costume of mature males and inelastic to alterations of mass by expansion. How was the irritation allayed? He removed his collar, with contained black necktie and collapsible stud, from his neck to a position on the left of the table. He unbuttoned successively in reversed direction, waistcoat, trousers, shirt, and vest, along the medial line of irregular, incrustated black hairs extended in triangular convergence from the pelvic basin over the circumference of the abdomen and umbilical fossicle, along the medial line of nodes to the intersection of the sixth pectoral vertebrae, thence produced both ways at right angles and terminating in circles described about two equidistant points, right and left, on the summits of the mammary prominences. He unbraced successively each of six minus one braced trouser buttons, arranged in pairs, of which one incomplete. What involuntary actions followed? He compressed between two fingers the flesh circumjacent to a cicatrice in the left infracostal region below the diaphragm, resulting from a sting inflicted two weeks and three days previously, 23rd May 1904, by a bee. He scratched imprecisely with his right hand, though insensible of prurition, various points and surfaces of his partly exposed, wholly obluted skin. He inserted his left hand into the low, low... He inserted his left hand into the left lower pocket of his waistcoat and extracted and replaced a silver coin, one shilling, placed there, presumably, on the occasion, 17 October 1903, of the internment of Mrs. Emily Sinico, Sydney Parade. Compile the budget for 16 June 1904. Debit, one pork kidney, three pence. One copy Freeman's Journal, one pence. One bath and gratification, one shilling, sixpence. Tram fare, one pence. One memoriam, Patrick Dingham, five pence. Two Banbury cakes, one pence. One lunch, seven pence. One renewal fee for book, one shilling. One packet, note paper, and envelopes, two pence. One dinner gratification, 
two shillings one postal order and stamp two shillings eight pence tram fare one pence one pig's foot four pence one sheep's trotter three pence one cake fries plain chocolate one shilling one square soda bread four pence one coffee and bun four pence loan stephen dedalus refunded one pound seven shillings balance sixteen shillings sixpence credit cash on hand four shillings nine pence commission received freeman's journal one pound seven shillings sixpence loan stephen dedalus one pound seven shillings totals debit two pounds nineteen shillings three pence total credit two pounds nineteen shillings three pence did the process of divestiture continue sensible of a benign persistent ache in his foot soles he extended his foot to one side and observed the creases protuberances and salient points caused by foot pressure in the course of walking repeatedly in several different directions then inclined he disnoted the lace knots unhooked and loosened the laces took off each of his two boots for the second time detached the partially moistened right sock through the forepart which the nail of his great toe had again effaced raised his right foot and having unhooked a purple elastic sock suspender took off his right sock placed his unclothed right foot on the margin of the seat of his chair picked at and greatly lacerated the protruding part of the great toenail raised the part lacerated to his nostrils and inhaled the odor of the quick then with satisfaction threw away the lacerated ungual fragment why with satisfaction because the odor inhaled corresponded with other odors inhaled of other ungual fragments picked and lacerated by master bloom pupil of mrs ellis's juvenile school patiently each night in the act of brief genuflection and nocturnal prayer and ambitious meditation in what ultimate ambition had all concurrent and consecutive ambitions now coalesced not to inherit by right of primogeniture gravel kind or borough english or possess in perpetuity an excessive demands of a sufficient number of acres roods and perches statue land measure valuation forty two pounds of grazing tubery surrounding a baronial hall with gate lodge and carriage drive nor on the other hand a terrace house or semi-detached villa described as rus en herbe or qui sisana but to purchase by private treaty in fee simple a thatched bungalow-shaped two-story dwelling-house of southerly aspect surmounted by vane and lightning conductor connected with the earth with porch covered by parasitic plant ivy or virginia creeper hall door olive green with smart carriage finish and neat door brasses stucco front with gilt tracery on eaves and gable rising if possible upon a gentle eminence with agreeable prospect from balcony with a stone pillar parapet over unoccupied and unoccupiable interjacent pastures and standing in five or six acres of its own ground at such a distance from the nearest public thoroughfare as to render its house lights visible at night above and through a quick-set hornbeam hedge of tapiary cutting situated at a given point not less than one statute miles from the periphery of the metropolis within a time limit of not more than fifteen minutes from tram or train line e g dundrum south or sutton north both localities equally reported by trial to resemble the terrestrial poles in being favorable climates for physical subjects the premises to be held under fee farm grant lease nine hundred and ninety nine years 
the message to consist of one drawing-room with bay window two lancets thermometer affixed one sitting-room four bedrooms two servants rooms tiled kitchen with close range and scullery lounge hall filled with linen wall presses fumed oak sectional bookcase containing the encyclopedia britannica and the new century dictionary transverse obsolete medieval and oriental weapons dinner gong alabaster lamp bowl pendant vulcanite automatic telephone receiver with adjacent directory hand tufted axminster carpet with cream ground and trellis border loo table with pillar and claw legs hearth with massive fire brasses and ormolu mantel chronometer clock guaranteed timekeeper with cathedral chime barometer with hygrographic chart comfortable lounge settees and corner fitments upholstered in ruby plush with good springing and sunk center three banner japanese screen and cuspidors club style rich wine colored leather gloss renewable with a minimum of labor by use of linseed oil and vinegar a pyramidical prismatic central chandelier luster bentwood perch with finger tame parrot expurgated language embossed mural paper at ten shillings per dozen with transverse swags of carmine floral design and top crown fringe staircase three continuous flights at successive right angles of varnished clear-grained oak treads and risers newel balusters and handrail with step-up panel dado dressed with camphorated wax bathroom hot and cold supply reclining and shower water closet at mezzanine provided with opaque single panel oblong window tin-up seat bracket lamp brass tear rod and brace armrests footstool and artistic oleograph in inner face of door ditto plain servants apartments with separate sanitary and hygienic necessities for cook general and between maid salary rising by biennial unearned increments of two pounds with comprehensive fidelity insurance annual bonus one pound and retiring allowance based on the sixty-five system after thirty years service pantry buttery larder refrigerator out to offices coal and wood cellarage with wine bin still and sparkling vintages for distinguished guests if entertained to dinner evening dress carbon monoxide gas supply throughout what additional attractions might the grounds contain as addenda a tennis and fives court a shrubbery a glass summer-house with tropical plants equipped in the best botanical manner a rockery with water spray a beehive arranged on humane principles oval flower beds in rectangular grass plots set with eccentric ellipses of scarlet and chrome tulips blue scillus crocuses polyanthus sweet william sweet pea lily of the valley bulbs obtained from sir james w mackey limited wholesale and retail seed and bulb merchants and nurserymen agents for chemical manures twenty three sackville street upper an orchard kitchen garden and vinery protected against illegal trespassers by glass-topped mural enclosures a lumber shed with padlocks for various inventoried implements as eel traps lobster pots fishing rods hatchet steel yard grindstone clod crusher swathe turner carriage sack telescope ladder ten tooth rake washing clogs hay tender tumbling rake bill hook paint pot brush hoe and so on what improvements might be subsequently introduced a rabbit tree fowl run a dovecoat, a botanical conservatory, two hammocks, ladies and gentlemen's, a sundial shaded and sheltered by laburnum or lilac tree, 
an exotically harmonically accorded Japanese tinkle gate bell affixed to left lateral gate post, a capricious water butt, a lawn mower with side delivery and grass box, a lawn sprinkler with hydraulic hose. What facilities of transit were desirable? When city-bound, frequent connection by train or tram from their respective intermediate station or terminal. When country-bound, velocipedes a chainless freewheel roaster cycle with side basket car attached or draft convenience, a donkey with wicker trap or smart phaeton with good working solid angular cob, roan gelding, 14H. What might be the name of this erigible or erected residence? Bloom Cottage, St. Leopold's, Flowerville. Could Bloom of 7 Eccles Street foresee Bloom of Flowerville? In loose all-wood garments with Harris Tweed cap, price 8 shillings 6 pence, and useful garden boots with elastic gussets and watering can, planting aligned young fir trees, syringing, pruning, staking, sowing hayseed, trundling a weed-laden wheelbarrow with excessive fatigue at sunset amid the scent of new-mown hay, ameliorating the soil, multiplying wisdom, achieving longevity. What syllabus of intellectual pursuits was simultaneously possible? Snapshot photography, comparative study of religion, folklore relative to various amatory and superstitious practices, contemplation of the celestial constellations. What lighter recreations? Outdoor, garden and field work. Cycling on level macadamized causeways, ascents of moderately high hills, natation in secluded fresh water, and unmolested river boating in secure weary or lycurical with kedge anchor, on reaches free from weirs and rapids, period of estivation. Vespertinal perambulation or equestrian circumprocession with inspection of sterile landscape and contrastingly agreeable cottagers' fires of smoking peat turves, period of hibernation. Indoor. Discussion in tepid security of unsolved historical and criminal problems. Lecture of unexpurgated exotic erotic Lecture of unexpurgated exotic erotic masterpieces. House carpentry with toolbox containing hammer, all nails, screws, tin tacks, gimlet, tweezers, bullnose plane, and turn screw. Might he have become a gentleman farmer of field produce and livestock? Not impossibly, with one or two stripper cows, one pike of upland hay, and requisite farming implements, e.g., an end-to-end -end churn, a turnip pulper, etc. What would be his civic functions and social status among the country families and landed gentry? Arranged successively in ascending powers of hierarchical order, that of gardener, groundsman, cultivator, breeder, and at the zenith of his career, resident, magistrate, or justice of the peace, with a family crest, and a coat of arms, and appropriate classical motto, Semper Paratus. Duly recorded in the court directory, Bloom, Leopold, P. M.P., P.C., K.P., L.L.D., Honoris Causis, Bloomville, Dundrum, and mentioned in court and fashionable intelligence, Mr. and Mrs. Leopold Bloom have left Kingstown for England. What course of action did he outline for himself in such capacity? A course that lay between undue clemency and excessive rigor, 
the dispensation in a heterogeneous society of arbitrary class incessantly rearranged in terms of greater and lesser social inequality of unbiased homogeneous indisputable justice tempered with mitigants of the wildest possible latitude but extractable to the uttermost farthing with confiscation of estate real and personal to the crown loyal to the highest constituted power of the land actuated by an innate love of the rectitude his aims would be the strictest maintenance of public order the repression of many abuses though not of all simultaneously every measure of reform or retrenchment being a preliminary solution to be contained by fluxion in the final solution the upholding of the letter of the law common statute and law merchant against all traversers in covine and trespassers acting in contravention of bylaws and regulations all resuscitators by trespass and petty larceny of kindlings of venville rights obsolete by desuetude all orotund instigators of international persecution all perpetuators of international animosities all menial molesters of domestic conviviality all recalcitrant violators of domestic connubiality prove that he had loved rectitude from his earliest youth to master percy apjohn at high school in eighteen eighty he had divulged his disbelief in the tenets of the irish protestant church to which his father rudolf vereg later rudolf bloom had been converted from the israelic faith and communion in eighteen sixty five by the society for promoting christianity among the jews subsequently abjured by him in favor of roman catholicism at the epoch of and with a view to his matrimony in eighteen eighty eight to daniel magrain and francis wade in eighteen eighty two during a juvenile friendship terminated by the premature emigration of the former he had advocated during nocturnal preambulations the political theory of colonial e g canada expansion and the evolutionary theories of charles darwin expounded in the descent of man and the origin of species in eighteen eighty five he had publicly expressed his adherence to the collective and national economic program advocated by james finton layler john fisher murray john mitchell j f x o'brien and others the agrarian policy of michael davitt the constitutional agitation of charles stuart parnell m p for cork city the program of peace retrenchment and reform of william ewart gladstone m p for midlothian n b and in support of his political convictions had climbed up to a secure position amid the ramifications of a tree in northumberland road to see the entrance second of february eighteen eighty eight into the capital of a demonstrative torchlight procession of twenty thousand torch-bearers divided into one hundred and twenty trade corporations bearing two thousand torches in escort of the marquess of ripon and honest john morley how much and how did he propose to pay for his country residence as per prospectus of the industrious foreign acclimatized nationalized friendly state aid building society incorporated eighteen seventy four a maximum of sixty pounds per annum being one-sixth of an assured income derived from gilt-edged securities representing five per cent simple interest or capital of twelve hundred pounds estimate of price at twenty years purchase of which to be paid on acquisition and the balance in the form of annual rent viz eight hundred pounds plus two and a half per cent interest on the same repayable quarterly in equal annual installments 
until extinction by amateurization of loan advanced for purchase within a period of twenty years amounting to an annual rental of sixty four pounds head rent included the title deeds to remain in possession of the lender or lenders with a savings clause envisaging forced sale foreclosure and mutual compensation in the event of protracted failure to pay the terms assigned otherwise the message to become the absolute property of the tenant occupier upon expiry of the period of years stipulated what rapid but insecure means to opulence might facilitate immediate purchase a private wireless telegraph which would transmit by dot and dash system the result of a national equine handicap flat or steeplechase of one or more miles and furlongs won by an outsider at odds of fifty to one at three hours eight minutes p m at ascot greenwich time the message being received and available for betting purposes in dublin at two fifty nine p m dunsink time an unexpected discovery of an object of great monetary value precious stone valuable adhesive or impressed postage stamp seven shilling mauve imperforated hamburg eighteen sixty six fourpence rose blue paper perforate great britain 1855 one franc stone official related diagonal surcharge luxembourg 1878 antique dynastic ring unique relic in unusual repositories or by unusual means from the air dropped by an eagle in flight by fire amid the carbonized remains of an, an incendiated edifice in the sea amid flotsam jetsam legan and derelict on earth in the gizzard of a comestible fowl a spanish prisoner's donation of a distant treasure of valuables or specie or bullion lodged with a solvent banking corporation one hundred years previously at five per cent compound interest of the collective worth of five million pounds sterling a contract with an inconsiderable contractee for the delivery of thirty-two consignments of some given commodity in consideration of cash payment on delivery per delivery at the initial rate of a farthing to be increased constantly in the geometrical progression of two farthing halfpenny one penny threepence fourpence eightpence one shilling fourpence two shillings eightpence to thirty-two terms a prepared scheme based on a study of the laws of probability to break the bank of monte carlo a solution of the secular problem of the quadrants of the circle government premium one million pounds sterling what vast wealth acquirable through industrial channels the reclamation of dunhams of waste aerial soil proposed in the prospectus by agonath natum Bleibstrustrasse, Berlin, West 15, by the cultivation of orange plantations and melon fields and reforestation, the utilization of waste paper, fells of sewer rodents, animal excrement possessing chemical properties, in view of the vast production of the first, vast number of the second, and immense quantity of the third every normal human being of average vitality and appetite producing annually cancelling by-products of water a sum total of eighty pounds mixed animal and vegetable diet to be multiplied by four million three hundred and eighty six thousand and thirty five the total population of ireland according to the census returns of nineteen o one were these schemes of wider scope a scheme to be formulated and submitted for approval to the harbor commissioners for the exploitation of white coal hydraulic power obtained by hydroelectric plant at peak of tide at dublin bar or at head of water at pulafoca or powers court or catamit basins of main streams for the economic production of fifty thousand w h p of electricity 
a scheme to enclose the peninsula delta of the north bull at dolly mount and erect on the space of the foreland used for golf links and rifle ranges an asphalted esplanade with casinos booths shooting galleries hotels boarding houses reading rooms establishments for mixed bathing a scheme for the use of dog vans and goat vans for the delivery of early morning milk a scheme for the development of irish tourist traffic in and around dublin by means of petro-propelled river boats plying in the fluvial fairway between steamers for coatwise navigation ten shillings per person per day guide trilingual included a scheme for the repristination of passenger and goods traffics over irish waterways when freed from weed beds a scheme to connect by tramline the cattle market north circular road and prussia street with the quays sheriff street lower and east wall parallel with the lynx line railway laid in conjunction with the great southern and western railway line between the cattle park liffey junction and terminus of midland great western railway forty three to forty five north wall in proximity to the terminal stations at dublin branches of great central railway midland railway of england city of dublin steam packet company lancaster and northshire railway company dublin and glasgow steam packet company glasgow and dublin and londonderry steam packet company laird line british and irish steam packet company dublin and morecabe steamers london and north west railway company dublin port and dockets board landing sheds and transit sheds of palgrave murphy and company steamship owners agents for steamers from mediterranean spain portugal france belgium and holland and for liverpool underwriters association the cost of acquiring rolling stock for animal transport and of additional mileage operated by the dublin united tramway corporation limited to be covered by graziers fees positing what protasis would the contraction for such several schemes become a natural and necessary apodosis given a guarantee equal to the sum sought the support by deed or gift transfer vouchers during donor's lifetime or by bequest after donor's painless extinction of eminent financiers bloom pasha rothschild guggenheim hirsch montefiore morgan rockefeller possessing fortunes of six figures amassed during a successful life and joining capital with opportunity the thing required was done what eventually would render him independent of such wealth the independent discovery of a gold seam of inexhaustible ore for what reason did he meditate on schemes so difficult of realization it was one of his axioms that similar meditations or the automatic relation to himself of a narrative concerning himself or tranquil recollection of the past when practiced habitually before retiring for the night alleviated fatigue and produced as a result sound response and renovated vitality his justifications as a physicist he had learned that of the seventy years of complete human life at least two-sevenths viz twenty years are passed in sleep as a philosopher he knew that at the termination of any allotted life only an infinitesimal part of any person's desires had been realized as a physiologist he believed in the artificial placation of malignant agencies chiefly operative during somnolence what did he fear the committal of homicide or suicide during sleep by an aberration of the light of reason the incommensurable categorical intelligence situated in the cerebral convolutions what were habitually his final meditations 
of some one sole unique advertisement to cause passengers to stop in wonder a poster novelty with all extraneous accretions excluded reduced to its simplest and most efficient terms not exceeding the span of casual vision and congruous with the velocity of modern life end of chapter 17 c chapter 17 d the final part of chapter 17 continues